Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a great weekend. Um, I'm just doing a little bit of mixing right now. Um, nothing, nothing too complicated. I'm just, I'm going to be working on. Um, we don't need to look at the palette. Um, I'm just going to be working on the purple. So the purple, the mixture of the purple is pretty straightforward. I'm going to mix two shades, one for the light and one for the shadow. Um, nothing too big a deal. I'm going to keep it very simple. Um, and because again, it's not in in the painting. There's very little variation in the purple. The cuffs really where the biggest thing is, and you'll see there's a light on the top and a shadow on the bottom. But other than that, the like the collar is pretty much all dark, and it's a couple of light marks. Um, it's I, I think it's made of it's made of velvet, and so it's really kind of eating up light. Where the cuffs uh, are probably um, they're probably cotton or something like that. And so they're, you're seeing more, more variation in them. Um, so, but anyway, I'm just trying to match the color. It, it's just a, a very subtle combination of, of purple with some blue in it. Um, I want to make sure that I get it pretty close. I'm trying watching my value range. Again, value is always, always on my mind um, as light as light as the purple is and as colorful as it is, or let me just say, as brilliant as the color may look, it's still quite dark. Um, and so I wanna make sure that I'm not overstating it. And again, if you've seen, as you see the, if you've watched the earlier videos, you see how I controlled the value of the white and the flag and just how dark it actually was um, as a shade. And yet in the painting, it still reads as being white just off in the background where there's less light hitting it. Um, same with the cuffs, like the cuffs, are, or all of the purple, have an impression of being a certain value. Um, in large part, they, look, they do look brighter because of the amount of color. They're a very, very rich purple. And so I wanna make sure that even though they are a light, that I, that I, that I get a value that is correct. Right, and so I'm looking at something in here. You can see it's only a little bit lighter than the jacket. So, and so I'm going to mix two shades. I mix the light first, and now I'm just going to, and then I'll mix a shadow. And again, we're not we're not going to go down and look at the palette today. It's really not. It's not any anything that. Um, again, you're not mixing this color, so the color combination is really not important. Just suffice it to say that it's, it's a purple and a blue and a little bit of white to elevate the value. Again, the white strips away some of the color. I'll probably have to glaze some of the color back in because the painting is a very high chroma. Everything in here right now is so rich and so dynamic. Um, this purple that I put in may look a little bit dull. It's pretty colorful on the palette, but it may look a little bit dull in here. Um, I've made it a little bit lighter than it is in the in the photograph, because I know that I'm gonna glaze on top of it. Even if it's a very subtle glaze, that glaze is gonna knock some of the value down. Well, I talked about that in the last video, right? I think it was the last video, either the last one or the one before that. I talked about how the... Can you raise your voice a little bit, yeah. having volume issues? Uh, I talked about how the glazes break down the light, um, and so a layer of glaze darkens the painting, so I'm gonna make the cuff a little bit lighter, just a little bit, than I think it needs to be because I know that I'm gonna add a little bit of color to it later on. So I'm accounting for that already and I'm making the decision right here on the spot. As I mix the purple and I look at it against the photograph, I can't get an opaque pass of purple colorful enough to match the photo. So I'm gonna make it a little bit lighter, which is gonna strip away a little color, but then I'm gonna be able to lay a glaze on top, which is gonna be pure color. Um, and that'll be done after it dries, it'll be done in the third stage. But I'm accounting for the third stage right now while I'm mixing this color based on what I'm seeing in real time. I didn't figure this out before I started the painting. I'm seeing it now as I'm starting to work.
So I'm also having to make a decision about something. So I'm just going to put this up here so you can see it. So I've got the color of the purple matching. Like I said, it's not quite as colorful, so I've made it a little lighter to leave room for glazing. The shadow in here matches the value of the shadow on the jacket. However, I've made the jacket much lighter than it's going to be at the end because I am going to glaze it. So instead of going to this value, I'm going to go to this value, what the darkest shade in the jacket, so it matches up the cuff to the jacket. I will then have to glaze that later on. Otherwise, the cuff's gonna pull away from all this. It's gonna look funny with these extreme darks in here where the, where the cuff in the shadow is actually darker than the black tuxedo in the shadow, and I don't want that. So I've gotta match the, not the color, but I've gotta match the value of the jacket. I don't remember what I did with the jacket. Um, I don't remember what I mixed to create this, but I'm not worried about the color. I'm just worried about the value. I'll neutralize the shadow. It's not gonna be very colorful. It's gonna be kind of grayed down, but I'm gonna to try, to, try to get it close to this. It might have a little bit more purple in it um, when it's all said and done. All right, and so I've started with a mixture of black, um, some violet and some blue, right? And I'm just gonna put this up here so you can see it. Obviously, it reads as black against this. So I'm now gonna just start to elevate it a little bit with some white, just open it up. It's gonna be a bit of a gray, which is what I want. I don't want it to be too light. And I do want it to feel like it has some color in it. I don't want it to be an absolute gray. I want it to look like, like say a purple or a gray that has a little bit of purple in it. But I wanna be able to recognize the purple. I don't want it to look just like gray. And I don't want it to look purple either. I want it to be kind of on the fence between them. All right, so right now as I'm going, I'm getting closer to the value, but I don't have any color in this. So I'm gonna to have to build in a bit more color. And I don't want to depart too much from the shadow color of the tuxedo, right? The tuxedo is very, it's, it's arguably black in its shadows. The cuff is basically the same. I don't want the cuff to be one color in these extremely dark shadows and the jacket to be a different color. I want them to feel very much the same because um, that's going to help to unify the shadows. The lit part of the tuxedo and the lit part of the cuff will separate the two from each other so they don't look like they're the same material. But the shadows I can use to unify um, that area of the painting so that um, the cuff doesn't jump away both in the lights and in the shadows. Because in the photograph, they really kind of match. The only thing separating this from this is this bit of a gold band. And that's all you need. If you took the gold band out, you wouldn't be able to determine the edge between these two, right? The tuxedo and the cuff. And so I want to try to stay, you know, stay close to the to that so that the gold is the only thing really distinguishing them and again i'm not going to get a spot on match i'm not worried about a spot on match in the end the cuff is purple and the, and the tuxedo is black so i'm not looking for a perfect match but i do want to stay close so i'm I feel like i'm getting a little bit too blue drop a little bit more purple in there i think i'm gonna lighten it up just a little bit again, I'm just, I'm experimenting with the color and I keep testing it against the photograph to see. Um, I can say that in the, uh, in the program, uh, in Evolve, people, as they get more advanced in the program, forget to check their colors. And we see it a lot where, like in block four, people will be absolutely like murdering the stuff. One color after another is just exactly what it's supposed to be because they're testing them, making sure before they get applied to the painting, that they fit. And then they'll get into block like five where color is not so big a deal. And then block six rolls around and they're not, they're not testing anything anymore. It's like they've forgotten to do that. But you'll see like as I'm working, I'm testing this the whole time. I'm not, I'm not assuming that if I can see it on the palette that, it's, that that's good enough. I'm testing it against this to see. So now I'm a little bit light, but I'm around the right color. I'm gonna drop a little bit more, I'm gonna drop a little bit of paint gray. Paint gray is not as, 
it's not as strong as black, so it's gonna it's gonna give me it's gonna let me darken this a little bit without pushing it too far. The black the black is a little bit more intense because of its opacity, and so um, if I put in even a little bit too much, kind of back to having to remix um, here, the Payne's gray will will slowly nudge it. So I'm still a little bit light. have a couple questions. Yes. Uh, Sana mentioned that the painting looks a lot more vibrant with the isolating layer. Yes. And Frank was asking, uh, what did you use to make the isolating layer? What medium? The isolating layer is, is pure um, Old Holland Alkid medium. Um, nothing else in it. And I put it on with a six inch foam roller. Um, if you go to a hardware store and you find like these really stiff foam rollers, they're used for cabinets and doors. Um, I use that to apply them, uh, to apply it, because it gives a really even, a very thin and very even coat. It doesn't leave any brush strokes behind. Um, and that's what I want. I don't want, I don't want the isolating layer to, to look like part of the painting. I, or look like it's, um, I don't want it to contribute to the look of the painting other than to be a very, very thin pane of glass that separates what is underneath from what's on top and brings everything up to the original color and value that I mixed when I was making the painting, right? So, um, again, and you can see, for those of you who are in the program, or even not in the program, Look at how many times I've gone back to check this this value. I am making sure it is exactly what I want it to be, or as close as I can possibly manage. I've got a broad range of latitude to play with this color. I could be a full value off and I'll just glaze it down to where I want it to be. But I don't want to be lazy about it. I want to try to get it a spot on match if I can, because that eliminates me having to use the glaze to both adjust the, the color or the value for where I want the painting to be. And you know, you can, so you use a glaze and it's like, if you're only augmenting the painting a little bit based on what you had planned, the glaze only does one job. But if you are doing that and having to correct kind of lazy color and value decisions early on, the glaze is doing double duty. And you don't want the glaze doing any more work than it needs to. And so better to, better to take your time and make sure that your colors and your values are exactly where you intend them to be so that the glaze is not doing that job. So that's looking pretty good to me. It's not an absolute spot on match, but it's really close. And so um, I'm gonna stop there, I think. A question from yes. Nicholas Probst. Yes. Does it help to start certain areas first than other areas of the painting like during the first pass? Um, you know what experience kind of tells you? So like for me, I'll, I, I, like, I like to work my backgrounds first. An environment, and you'll see that process throughout as I work. Environment in, in a lot of ways determines everything else. And so I could put down a flesh tone first, kind of work on him, and then find myself this not aligning with what I put back in here. The bigger open spaces are easier to figure out, and then you get into the smaller things. Uh, also, if I push the background up against him, and then I put him in and I push back out, the background's not encroaching on the figure. Where the, you know, this is easy to, to change and to fix into detail, like if I push um, flesh tone out into the background, it's easy for me to correct out here because there's no details. But if I got these background colors encroaching on the face, now I've got to clean up. These are all gonna be what you would think of as detailed areas. Those colors have to be right. The background, you have quite a bit of latitude to play. So I always do the backgrounds first. Again, it's the space, the space. I talked about this early on. You put a person in the swamp, the swamp colors the skin. So if you paint the skin first and you paint it to look like skin, when you put in the green swamp, the person's gonna look ridiculous. They're gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna look like a cardboard cutout, not attached to the space. 
if you paint the background in first, the moment you start putting in those regular skin tones, you'll realize they don't look right. They need a lot more green in them to make sense. So here, his flesh tones don't actually look, well, this color is not a flesh tone, but it looks good in this environment. All of these colors that are in here right now are based on the environment. If I put this jacket in a different environment, it wouldn't look the same, right? And so everything is related to everything else. Everything is relative. This red is determined by this red. Not, not necessarily the color, but like how bright and how colorful, like the chroma. And, but decisions for this book are based on this red. Decisions for this white are based on this white. If I put this in first, this is not as easy to figure out, right? I can diminish this and I can start there and then build this based on the environment. It's just, it's easier to manage the bigger environmental space first and then figure out the, the particulars of, this, of the, the figure later on. And again, it's not the only way to do it, but I find that this is the way, this is the best way to do it, to, to avoid um, major mistakes in color and value selection early on. Again, remember, we're talking about, imagine if there was no background and if the background was just gray and I painted the figure first by itself. There's a good chance I would have light in the, in the tie and I would have black in the jacket. I've now exhausted the entire value scale the entire value scale from pure white to pure black and everything in between. Figuring out the background relative to that now becomes a bit complicated. If I do it the other way around and I keep everything very subtle because right, the background is not going to have those extremes. And it's easier to kind of not be so particular with something that's going to be out of focus 10, 15 feet away. It's not so easy to play so fast and loose with something you think in, in your mind has to be taken care of with great detail and great care. So the stuff that can be kind of sloppy and loose, and I don't mean really sloppy, I just mean kind of laid out there and soft edge, it's easier to define the mood there and then take that and build the stuff that needs the critical marks afterwards. Again, it just it helps set the stage. You don't have to do it that way, but I find that you get not just a better result, but it's, it's easier. It's easier to do that. Right? And the idea, the idea with an education is to get, at least in art, to be able to get, one, a consistent result. And a consistent result requires at least some kind of consistency in your process. You don't want to be the same every time, but there, has to be, there have to be anchor points. Right? So consistency of result. And the other thing that you want is you want to be able to increase speed while getting that consistent result. Right, And so if you have a process, always the background first, you're able to make sense of what you do with the figure. You, you learn that what this has to offer for this. And so the likelihood of you making really, really drastic mistakes here after this has established the, the setting goes down as you do more and more of it. Right? But the idea is that you know, the education is to tell you where not to go so that you don't, you're not stepping on landmines. Right? You create a pathway through the process from blank canvas to finished painting, and you utilize that, that structure um, to help guide you. And the more you do it, the better you get at understanding where the pitfalls are, where the problems emerge. Um, but, but again, I, I recommend always starting with your environment. Um, and if, like, so if you're gonna do a, like, if you're gonna paint a figure from direct observation, let's say you're gonna do a portrait from life, you would start and maybe draw the face, block in a shadow, block in a light. So you're talking about two values, one shadow, one light, that's it. At that point, you would then start establishing the background because even though you've got a color for the, for the face and a color for the shadow, you really don't know what they need to be until you have established the environment they're in. So you immediately start painting out on the sides of the face to see if the flesh tone makes sense, if the shadow makes sense. Also bear in mind, the face turns, right? So you've got a whole bunch of different shades. Which one did you pick for the shadow? Which one did you pick for the light? Did you pick a dark thing or a light thing? 
in the lights, right? Because the lights aren't all equal. Some are very light, you've got highlights, and some are very dark, where you're kind of turning the form. Which one did you pick as that base flesh tone to put down? The background is arguably, arguably going to be flat and even. It's one color, one shade, basically. So as long as you match it, now you can see exactly how that flat single color value relates to all of the turns in the form and all the variations, right? So it's easier to figure out the green wall behind the, the sitter than it is to figure out the flesh tone of the sitter. Once the green wall is in, or whatever the wall is, then you start building the flesh tone around how it relates to the green wall. So even doing it from direct observation, you might start by scribbling in the figure, but you gotta get the background in. It turns out Alan Yost is a former student of Rutgers. Really? Does he still live in Jersey? No. He's, where's he at? He said, St. Louis. Oh, okay. I was going to invite you to come visit. I mean, the invitation's extended regardless. It's just a bit of a commute for you. Okay, so, I'm gonna work on, I'm gonna do the collar afterwards. Like I have, I'm gonna be able to rest my hand as I go. But the idea is I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get the collar, the cuff, and then the purple down in the apron done. And again, I have both today and tomorrow. We will be doing the face on Wednesday. If I knock out all the purple today, which I don't think I'll do based on track record uh, being here working, if I get that done, I may jump in and do a couple of other things back in here, maybe play with the metals a little bit. There's some stuff I could do back in here to start setting the groundwork for what will come. Um, so, but the idea is I'm gonna knock out the purple. I'm gonna make sure I've got some, like I've got a dark down in here that should line up more with the background that I missed. Um, I keep missing this space down in the painting, um, but I wanna make sure that I, that I bring this in line with this background before, um, before I start moving the rest of the painting. Like, there's gonna be more to be done here. I'm gonna have to push this a lot further with the glaze than I want to. If I have to do like, one value shift here, this will require like a three value shift in the glaze. I don't want that. I want to make sure this is right. So again, I'm setting the stage for the third pass. I won't start the third pass until everything is where it needs to be for that purpose. So I need a good, clean, um, unused brush for this. Um, I want to make sure that the brushes that I'm using have not been beaten up because there's going to be a lot of ins and outs around the gold. Now, one of the nice things about what I'm about to do is that after I put the purple in, not only am I establishing the purple, but the purple is going to establish all of the shapes of the details, much like I did over here, um, but probably even more so. Like this, this just kind of holes that I'm showing the background. Somebody actually posed a question, I saw it online, asking about why I detailed this, but actually, uh, because because these are well up front, but I haven't finished the table yet. Actually, what I did is I only painted in the background. I painted in this, just kind of showing through. And by doing that, I've kind of solidified the shapes. I made a few marks inside of here just so that, because I want to make sure that you can see the lines as I go in and I start working in my next pass. Um, so I'm going to start with I'm going to start with the cuff. And now that this is sealed, I can kind of move this around. Everything is dry. I can move this around and not really worry about stripping things off the, like um, when, I, when I put the, the tape up over here, when I pulled it, it lifted paint. There are little dots of paint missing. I had to go back and kind of touch them up. Um, but I wanna, I, now that this is sealed, and it, I sealed it Saturday, so it's two days, there's a day and a half it's been sitting, it's bone dry. It's not gonna come up. Everything underneath it should be locked down. Um, and I say should, I hate the idea of saying that it would def that that's definitely the case. Over my career, I've never had anything come up after it's been sealed. But I'm always afraid to say definitively that that's the reality. The tape that I use is a low-tack painter's tape. Not artist tape, but painter's tape. So it shouldn't be stripping away things anyway. 
but it does grab a hold of the photographs pretty tightly. And as I said, you know, it did pull a couple of little dots of paint. Um, so, so I went and I kind of, like I said, I touched them up a little bit so that they're not white, they're now gold. And now I'm going and I'll start playing with this. Yes. Did you add detail to the background before I, the isolating coat? It appears that it has more depth. Um, well, if you look, so if you look at the two images, when the painting dried, all of the little subtle things that were there just disappeared, but they were still in the painting. Now, um, I do want to say like down in here, when you watched me paint, after we finished, I took a rag and I literally just scrubbed out a couple of marks just to, rather than leave it as one plugged up black hole, I just, I literally took a rag and folded it up like this and I scrubbed out a few things. And so basically what you see in here that look like details, there's literally, all it is is an absence of paint. Everything else is the dark stuff I put down and then I just defined the table. I decided that I could probably glaze over this. If I pulled this stuff out, when I glaze over it, everything will go a value darker. So this will still be visible, particularly the harder edges. And I won't have to actually go in and paint in those details. But the stuff up top, this stuff, really kind of disappeared when the paint dried, but it was there the whole time. And if you go back and you watch the video when I first put this in, you'll see I actually went into great care to do this, but it's very subtle. And so it disappeared. Same down in here, you can see like this drop off. It wasn't obvious when it dried. It all looked about the same. And again, this is part of the beauty of that isolating layer. The painting dries and it dries funny. It's, it's dull in some places and shiny in others and things gray down. And, and so um, when you isolate and you, you bring everything back up to that, that original luster, it's not adding anything to the painting. It's giving back to you what you originally painted, okay? So everything that you see here was in the original painting, was in the original past. It just disappeared as the painting, um, it disappeared from view, it was still in the painting. And once we isolate it, um, that, that glaze um, or that varnish that we use as a, an isolating layer brings it back out so we can see it the way the painting looked when we originally put it down. This is a very important thing. So the first pass I did didn't dry that way. It dries very even. The second pass, the first layer draws the oil from the first pass down into it, leaving, um, leaving the surface with a deficiency of oil. It kind of dries up and you can't, you can't guess at what, that ha what happens to the painting when that happens. It's not like you can say, well, it's always one value lighter and 10% less chromatic. Every single color and every single oil percentage affects that. So you never try to match a dried area that's all sunken in with wet paint. You have to seal the painting. Now that this is sealed, I can match this color for color, value for value, and I know that as long as I match it wet, even when it dries, if it sinks in, when I varnish the painting, it will then match. But if I tried to work these areas with another pass while it was still dry and sunken in, it would be all over the place. I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to hope to estimate what was actually going on there from the original pass. Um, and so you, you do, you need an isolating layer for this. Again, some artists do what's called oiling out. And all that is is they take a rag with some linseed oil and they kind of rub it on the painting and that brings the painting back up. The problem with that is you're creating an oil slick to work on, it, it, to me. The isolating layer that I use has an alkyd, it, it has more, more tooth to it. Um, the paint that I'll put down, it'll swim on the surface a little bit, but it'll bite once it's, once it's in place. Um, also, when you oil out, within a few minutes, it's back to being dull again. And so, I, again, I prefer, I prefer to do an isolating layer, freeze everything that's down, nothing is gonna come up now, everything is, got, is underneath that isolating layer is forever. It's very thin, I mean, really thin. There's barely anything there, but it, it's just the, the, just the thinnest skin that I put down. And now I can work pretty comfortably without worrying about what's underneath. And I can also see very clearly exactly what the painting will look like or what the painting actually looks like. Um, so I can now start matching, you know, right to what I've got here.
So, I am going to start. So I'm going to start by putting down a little bit of a little bit of medium, not straight medium. So in here, these golds are lit. These are in shadows. So this shade actually works very nice for the shadows down in here. I could probably nudge it just a little bit darker. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very, very light coat and I'm going to create a gradient going from slightly darker and then fading up into here. And what that's going to let me do when I put the purple down, I'm going to be able to blend the edge into wet paint. It's going to be a bit of a glaze. But when I do these later on and I put in all the lights, the shadows will be fully established and I'll only have to paint the lights. So again, um, I just have to decide where I want to go color-wise. Um, and you can see even down in here, like this is very dark. I want to make sure I'm accounted for it. This is not dark enough. I don't want to have to glaze that by itself if I don't have to um, after the purple is in because what I would glaze the band with and the purple would be very different. So I want to make sure that I'm, I'm getting a good, proper tone for that. It's a shadow, so it's not going to be as colorful as the light. Uh, so I'm looking at something, a little bit of purple. Now remember, when I'm doing this, it's not that I'm putting down purple and purple becomes the color. There's gold underneath it. So if I put down purple on gold, they kind of neutralize each other, right? And so I'm thinking in those terms. Like, if I'm not just figuring out a color. I'm figuring out a color that when this shows through it, will that give me what I want, right? And so purple on top of gold is going to be a very, is going to be quite neutral. Um, so I'm going to lean it a little bit more pink. Uh, because I think that that's going to give me that's going to give me a better color when the when the uh, the gold shows through. And it's not a very I'm not mixing a very um, thick mixture. It's going to be thinned down quite a bit. I'm not looking to I'm not looking to drastically alter what's here. What's here is actually pretty solid. Um, I am just nudging it a little bit. So I'm making it I'm I'm making it a little bit more pink so that it becomes more of a like a grayed down orange. And again, I'm not looking my, my paint is gonna be very thin. Just enough, just enough to tint. Nothing more. Right, I can get solid strokes with it, um, but it'll be completely see-through. And so, again, I'll test it first, and this is the same. So down here is a little safer to test it. And so I'm just looking at it, making sure that it's not too colorful, because shadows, again, an absence of light means an absence of color. I don't want it to be too colorful. This is reading a little too colorful for me. I'm gonna drop a little bit of So I could go with a little bit of brown, or I could go with a little bit of yellow. The brown will neutralize it. Um, the, brown, the brown by itself, brown is a very neutral color. So I could neutralize it with that, or I could use yellow, which will take some of the purple out. Um, the yellow I worry about is another high chromatic color. And so I'm thinking the brown is probably a better option to neutralize with. And again, I'm not using a lot. It's a very small amount of burnt umber, um, but I want the I want the color to now feel a little bit more. Um, I want to be able to look down and see a little bit of brown in the mixture. And again, I know that what's underneath it is still very colorful. Like what I what's on the canvas is very colorful. So even if I put straight brown and it's somewhat see through, I'm going to be seeing some of the gold through it. All right, and you can see this wipes up very easily because of the isolating layer. So, so I'm just gonna... So it's still a little bit chromatic to me, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry about it. I think it, it's actually, 
it's actually relative to what these goals will be, um, I think it's going to be fine. I think, I think it's going to be fine. It's neutral enough. And the painting has a very high, what we call, color key. It's extremely colorful. Every aspect of this painting is done in color. There's nothing neutral here. Even the things that look neutral aren't. And so I think that I can get away with this. I think this will be good. If I find that I'm wrong, right? So there's, there's gonna be a margin of error here. If it's too colorful, it may not be a problem in the final painting because of what it is and how small the spaces are. Remember, even though I'm gonna fill some of these things, it's gonna be a couple of little marks in here on the leaves. It'll be a band here and a band here. That's basically the extent of it. So it may be just fine. Um, if I find that it's too chromatic, I'll have to gray it down with a glaze. It's a little bit more work, but I'm thinking this is actually okay. I think this is, this is fine. Um, it's close enough. And again, I, I hate to use that kind of terminology when I'm talking to students, because my perception of close enough and your perception of close enough might be this far apart. Close enough to me is that I'm the only one who will know that I made this choice and I let this thing go by. Even another pro might look at that color and go, yeah, maybe not the choice I would have made, but it does what it's supposed to do. It's a bit, there's a big difference. And so when I say that, you know, that it's close enough, my, my standards are so high and my margins of error are paper thin in my head. So um, just bear that in mind as you, as you hear language like that come from me. Right, and you can see this is showing through it. Try not to contaminate anything around it if I can help it. Um, and again, I mean, I'm gonna blend out the edges. It's not gonna be sharp edged when I'm done. Question? Yes. Can the isolating layer be used with any medium? Um, no, no. Um, like, so if you did this with, if you did the isolating layer with linseed oil, um, it's gonna be wet for like a year. It's imagine if you took olive oil and poured it out on a counter in your kitchen. How long would it take to dry? How much dust would wind up in it, right? Um, the isolating layer, you want it to dry quickly um, so you need something, you need something that's going to lock it up, um, it's going to dry it, you know, get it, get it drying quickly. Arguably, you want it to be bone dry overnight, even quicker than that if possible. Um, you can look up, uh, you can look up, um, I don't remember the name of the book, that, the big book. Uh, Mayer is the name of the guy, M-A-Y-E-R, but it's an artist's handbook. And he talks about isolating layers in there. And he has actually, I believe in the book, he's got a couple of formulas for it. Um, I could be wrong. A lot of the stuff in his books, he's got formulas. And they'll be like basic mixtures of things. Um, but, you know, they use um, stand oil and terps. Um, I, don't, I don't remember what the, it's been a long time since I've been through um, organizing this stuff and doing my own research. It's been decades. And so, um, though I do go back and reassess some of these things as time goes by, as new products come out, a lot of the stuff, I'm not going back and I'm not changing what I do really um, because I, I've already got a process. I like how, yeah, so it's called The Artist's Handbook by Ralph Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, it's a technical manual on, on art and artist materials and things like that. And so not a bad thing to have it in your, in your library. And it's not just oil paint, it's, 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 um, it's all mediums, I believe, pretty sure. Um, but it's, it's a good book to have in your, in your collection. Um, it's gonna, it, it'll give you access. You can even see like if you get really serious about what you're doing, different interactions between different colors of paint, right? Because you can't mix all, all paints with each other. Um, some paints interact with your heavy metals. Um, and so lead interacts with certain colors or certain, certain other heavy metals. 
and it'll tarnish your painting. Copper, lead, cadmium, like they, they have interactions. And so that book will actually give you a scientific breakdown of what those, what those um, pigments will do with each other and which ones don't go well together. It's almost like if you got medication, they give you three types of medication, and one of them says don't take it with the other two, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't take them together, right? And it's, it's the same kind of um, uh, like analysis, but for, for art materials. But the book is widely regarded. Um, Mayer is an expert at this stuff. I would, I would stick with I would stick with that alkyd medium for your isolating layer. I've not found anything better, and I, I know I've said this before. Um, I sound like a like a commercial, but Old Holland's alkyd is so clear. That's the one I use. Um, you have other alkyds. Um, then you have Galkid, which is from Gamblin, and you have Liquin from Windsor Newton. But like if you go in and you look at a bottle of liquid, it's so, it, it comes out of the jar. It comes out of the jar yellow. And you can do a test just like I have. Get a bottle of each, get a piece of white canvas and take a brush and do a stroke with each one. Now, you have to understand that when you mix this stuff into your paint, it's different. Um, what I'm telling you to do is put down medium without any pigment in it. And these mediums are not designed for that, okay? They're not designed with that purpose in mind. Pigments, right, so the, the medium comes out and it's a little bit yellow. And it will be yellow if it, is, if it stays unpigmented. If you put enough pigment, meaning paint, into it, the yellow is disguised, completely buried, because it's not intense. But as an isolating layer, the, 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 um, the alkyd made by Old Holland is just cleaner. It's clear. I mean, I've done side-by-side -side tests on these things um, because it matters. If I do a painting and I seal it and this white starts to look yellowed, I've lost, I've lost the beauty of what I've created. Everything winds up under a yellow cast. That's not any good for me. I want these colors to be exactly what they were when I, when I mixed them. And so in order for that to be the case, the isolating layer has to stay clear. And these mediums, a lot of them, if they're underpigmented, yellow and yellow dramatically. And so you can do the test yourself or you can just take my word for it, whatever makes you happy. But I would recommend sticking with the old Holland um, for this purpose. I mean, again, you, you don't want to create more problems in your work, you know, over product. You know, we use good paint because we don't want the paint to be the problem. We use a proper medium when we're making our painting because we don't want the medium to be the problem. When you isolate, you want to use a proper isolating medium for that. And again, over the years, I've experimented with a lot of things. Nothing comes close to alkyd. Now, that being said, I've spoken with people at Windsor Newton years and years ago. I used to use liquid because it's all that was there. Um, it was all that was on the market at the beginning. And I spoke with people at Windsor Newton and they said to me, Definitively, this should not be used as an isolating layer. However, it fits all of the criteria of what an isolating layer is supposed to do. Now, um, the people at Windsor Newton who are making the product are not artists. They're scientists, right? And so it meets the criteria. The problem with liquid is that it yellows. Again, you can see that even when you pick up a bottle in the store. It's, it's, it's pretty dark. And so, um, and it's not that it's not that the that the alkyd from from Old Holland is white, but again, you're not putting it down as thick as it looks in the bottle. It's borderline. It's just like hazy, but it's there's barely any yellow to it. And that's what you want. You want something that's not going to um, that's not going to affect the look of your painting. Anyway, so I've got my I've got my color down in here, and you can see nothing drastic. And now I'm just going to go in around it and I'm going to drop in my, my shadows. Have more questions about yes. the isolating layer? Yes, happy to answer them. Um, where'd it go? Oh, is the isolating layer the base color? It's clear. The isolating layer is clear. It's just out of the bottle, alkyd medium. And again, I put it on with a literally a six-inch roller, 
Um, and again, not one that's made of like like hair. It's made of foam. Um, and so it it's it's made for it's made for putting um, paint on absolutely smooth surfaces like cabinet doors. Um, so it doesn't leave it doesn't leave any marks behind, which is exactly what I want. I don't want the medium to be visible. I want it to do a job but be invisible. And so again, going back, Alkit is gonna be is gonna be nice because it's gonna dry very quickly. And so it's not gonna grab a lot of dust. Another question? Yes. Did the isolating layer cause the value of the one flag stripe above the book about six inches to appear orange? Um, oh, up in here, I or would say. Or is yeah. it the camera causing color distortion? Yeah, so in here, this is actually um, a yellow tassel. I just haven't put it in yet. There's a yellow tassel here, there's one in here, there's one out here, and then there's a bunch down in the bottom. I just haven't put them in yet. But if you look at the photo, we've got yellow tassel here, here, and down in here. I've just not put them in. That's holding a place for me. I haven't decided. Like, and you can see this whole edge is kind of messy right now. But when I glaze the background, I'm going to pull that background shape into the flag to marry the flag to some of these darks. So I've already planned for that. Like, I know where it's going. I mean, it won't be, it won't be, it won't be completely figured out until I get to it and I'm actually working on it, but I have an idea of where I'm going with it. Um, and so I'm establishing, I'm leaving messy edges, knowing that I'm going to be able to unify, or not, I'm saying messy edges, there's no edge at all. And there's a whole bunch of places where these things are kind of colliding, these colors and values are colliding into each other with no clear description of where one thing ends and one thing starts. I'll be able to define that stuff in, in, in absolute terms in the next pass. And you'll see it, it'll make sense when you see it. I can leave the edges of those, um, the edges of the flag, an absolute undefined mess right now because I'm going to be able to define those edges to the degree that I want either soft or tack sharp in the next pass. But again, it, it won't make sense until I get there and you see it being done. One of the things about this process is that the, is that the painting can look like it's in pieces one minute and then the next minute, fully put together and established. Um, but you have to get to the point where you pull everything together and that's really, like you're setting the stage right now, all of that stuff will then be pulled together in the very last, the very last minutes of the process. And again, if you stick around and you, and you watch, it'll make all the sense in the world when you see it. Another question? Yes. What are your thoughts on retouch varnish? Uh, when I did illustration, I used retouch varnish a lot. Um, it's sticky. I've, ne I've, never, I've never had a strip varnish off of a painting. And retouch varnish is a varnish that is designed as an inter intermediary varnish between finishing your painting and a year later doing a proper varnish. Um, I, I used it when I did illustration because we needed to have the paintings varnished so that they weren't dry and sunken in some places and glossy in others um, for reproduction purposes. But once I got away from doing illustration, I got away from that varnish as well. I'm actually a fan of, um, there's a company called Krylon, um, K-R-Y-L-O-N, and they make spray varnishes. And they have a varnish called Kmar, not Damar with a D, it's Kmar, K-A-M-A-R. It's a satin finish, dries in minutes. We're talking about two minutes, dry. Um, won't grab dust because it dries fast. And so like, I'm a big fan of that um, because I like the satin finish. Um, and I've played around with everything, beeswax and, and I, I I like something that's a little bit more on the side of, I'd be, rather do matte than, than gloss. And the satin's a nice middle ground in between. Um, it brings everything up to an even luster beautifully. Doesn't have a lot of reflection, you know, specular highlights and that kind of stuff, which I think distract from the painting. 
If you go to the museums and you look at a lot of the old masters, their paintings are not shiny. They're actually quite dull on the surface. They don't have a gloss to them. They're matte finished. Um, and it's just the varnishes that, that are used. They, they show off the painting. Um, and I have a lot of friends that use um, high gloss varnishes. I, it's just, again, it's a preference. I just feel like a high gloss varnish makes your painting look like a placemat. Um, you know, it's, it's highly gloss so it's easy to clean. And to me, the high gloss varnish doesn't offer any better protection as long as you have that, that finished barrier between the world and your art, you're good. So, um, but if you like retouch varnish, you can use it. It dries fast enough. It does stay sticky a bit longer. Um, but I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of um, of Kmart. And once I put varnish down, I don't paint on top of it again. Um, I found that retouch varnish you're supposed to be able to paint on top of it, but after you put it down, it does, doesn't. And I've I don't I've always found that if you start to paint on it it becomes gummy and it kind of grabs the paint and, and it, it, you wind up with a bit of a fist fight on your hands. And again, that's been my experience. So one of the things that retouch varnish is supposed to offer, which is the ability to go back in and continue to work after the varnish is applied, I don't find that to be the case. I find that retouch varnish actually makes it very hard to paint because it reactivates when you put paint and medium on it and it becomes gooey. And so, it's not, it's me, it's not a friendly material for that purpose. Question. Yes. Do you use the same medium in all of your paintings? Yes, I do. Um, and part of it is, it's very simple. I know exactly what to expect. I am not being, I'm not being blindsided by some weird something going on in the painting because I'm trying something new today. I'll experiment with different mediums when I'm doing other things, but I would never play around with another medium on a painting like this. Um, again, everything about my environment, my light's the same every day, my palette's the same every day, my brushes are the same every day. Everything about what I'm doing is structured and organized because there are enough hiccups and things that I'm gonna have to figure out on the fly here, why would I wanna put anything into the mix that adds complexity to the process. Now again, I am, I'm always open to experimenting with materials. I just wouldn't do them. I just wouldn't do it in a place where I'm working on something um, that, that's important. Just too much risk involved in it, and the risk doesn't have a benefit, to be, to be quite frank. There's no benefit to putting a commissioned piece at risk. And again, I'm saying at risk, you could talk about ruining a painting, you could talk about creating a painting that is not archival, that delaminates. Right? There's a lot of stuff that, that you run into. Um, but again, just adding time. Like I know how much time this medium is gonna give me before it starts to, to tack up. And I can work with that. It, so I have five parts oil, one part medium, uh, one part, part alkyd. I know how much time I have to paint. If, I have, if I'm only gonna be painting for say three hours today, I could put another part of alkyd in there because it'll dry it up and make it tacky sooner, right, for the smaller painting window. But I know what this paint does, what this medium does, and how it interacts with my paint, and what it's gonna do here. And the more I work with it, the more attuned I become to what it does. And so that just makes it easier for me to get done what I wanna get done without running into unexpected problems. Right? And if we can eliminate that, if we can eliminate the unexpected from the process, it makes, us, it makes it easier for us to achieve our goals. I mean, think about it. Imagine if you came in and every day the lighting was different. One day the light's over here, one day the light's over here. It's, it's a, you know, it's a 4,000 Kelvin one day, the next day it's over here. So like there's reflection on your palette while you're working. And you know, this, this is 5,000 Kelvin, the temperature's different, the colors look different, right? Imagine if you threw a random element into the process like that. Now, of course you wouldn't move the light around, but playing with the medium is just as bad. Um, once you figure out something that works, spend your time getting, getting better and better acquainted with it, with this little, with its little variations and idiosyncrasies and what it offers and doesn't offer. 
And over time, what will happen is you'll tweak the medium to best fit your, how much time you stand in front of an easel, how fast you work, how detailed you are, like all of those things. The medium would be like, well, you know, when I came back the second day, it was still wet. I know I can put more alkyd in it now because I want the painting dry the next day and the alkyd is the thing that dries it. So you, you go from five, five to one ratio to a four to one ratio or five to two ratio, right? You can play with both of those and see in a small painting what that does. Or even in a big painting, it's such a small change. But I wouldn't add another oil in there. I wouldn't switch from linseed to walnut. I wouldn't, because too much of a shift, you're not gonna be able to tell what's doing what. Right, and the idea is we don't want those surprises. So at the moment, I'm giving myself a little bit of breathing room away from the objects in here. I'm putting this down, filling the bulk of the shape, leaving myself about the thickness of the brush um, as a barrier away, and then I'm going to use a soft brush and just kind of push this up against the edges of the gold. That way these edges are not sharp. The fact that everything is wet helps to soften the edges when I put them in. Um, because I'm blending into what is arguably wet paint. But I'll be able to blur the edges a little bit. I don't have to go too crazy. Again, these are, these are actual details. Uh, and there will be details in the final painting. There'll be, there'll be some of the sharpest things in the painting. So even if I get them, I'm not razor sharp now, but even if I make them arguably sharp compared to everything else, I can leave them at that level through the remainder of the process and they would probably be just fine. They're not going to force my hand um, in a way that like getting the face too sharp will. And again, these are, these are mechanical, they're handmade objects or they're man-made objects. And so they have a mechanical nature to them where like the flag, even though it's man-made, the fact that it's fabric, all the, all the ripples and everything in it make it organic. Um, the, you know, the jacket is organic in nature. It has some mechanical edges, but this stuff is all fairly organic. But these, the metals, those are, those are machine cut. They're so precise and no angle that you put them at warps them. Like the flag is all straight lines, but then you let gravity grab a hold of it and it wrinkles and ripples in all kinds of directions. It no longer feels, um, mechanical. It feels organic. Um, the gloves feel organic but these other type details don't. And so the, sh the stuff that's not organic can be pretty, um, pretty precise and pretty, um, pretty sharp even at this stage. Again, not razor sharp, but I, can, I, can, I have a little bit of latitude to play with this. And again, I, this is not gonna be a one pass thing. I'm gonna go back over these shadows and these lights in another pass. So I'm gonna be able to um, do more with them at that time. You know, I was—I um, don't remember what the what the reason for bringing it up was, but um, a day or two ago, I was talking about um, uh, geometry. We're talking about the shortest distance between two points being a curve. I because I'm because I'm me. Nobody commented or wrote anything about it, so I'm assuming nobody nobody bothered to look it up. 
um, you either rolled your eyes or you just took it for what it was. I was mistaken. Actually, the geometry I was talking about was Euclidean. That's not the proper one. Differential geometry is the case um, where the shortest distance between two points is a curve. And so it's differential geometry. And that idea is not gravitational pull that warps space. It's mass that does it. And that's actually part of the theory of relativity. This existed before Einstein, and actually somebody introduced Einstein to it, which helped him to create the theory of relativity. Um, so it's been around a while. And I, but anyway, I wanted to correct the record on that. Differential geometry. For any of you who rolled your eyes and were like, shortest distance between two points can never be a curve. It's a straight line. I learned that in school. Right? Oh, I remember why I was talking about that. The difference between what you get in a classroom that is theory and what the real world is. In the real world, mass, like a planet, bends space. And so geometry that's on paper, this is the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, doesn't account for the reality of the world. And education, um, an education that's simply on paper, doesn't show you real world things necessarily. And so that's really where the experience comes in. Also, that's why you need to study with a pro because an amateur can tell you on paper what something should be, but if they've never made a living at this, they don't really know what, they don't understand the, how mass bends space. They only understand that on paper, they can see that the shortest distance is a straight line. So, differential geometry. Now, just in case you wondered about my personality, that's me. I went home and thought about it afterwards and was like, I need to make sure I've got this right. I looked it up. I went through and it took a while to find everything. Um, it was buried, but I was able to find it. I wanted to make sure that I was disseminating proper information. I can't stand to have, to have stuff out there that I said that's not correct. So, differential geometry. And for any of you who actually knew that, thank you for not putting me on the spot giving me the opportunity to correct myself. It's, that's no small kindness. So again, the paint that I'm putting down has some medium in it. Everything that goes down now, everything will have medium in it. Because of the isolating layer, layer I want everything to now have some of that alkyd in the mixture. So some stuff has gone down without in the prior layers, but at this point, everything will have some of that alkyd medium in it. And that's just gonna help to create a bond, um, alkyd to alkyd, as I build this up. And also at this point, as I move forward, the painting is going to have more and more medium as I go. Hey, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Did you have a home in Florida? No. No, I've never had a home in Florida. I've only ever lived in New York and New Jersey. I 
again, I'm just bumping this up against the gold. Some places, it's not, it's not very even in some places, and I'll go back and clean some of that up, and some of it I'll leave, leave little variations. Again, this is gonna get glazed when it's done, um, and so it doesn't have to be absolutely flawless. Um, you know, the, the paint can be broken up a little bit. It's just gonna add a little bit of character, some variation. I'm careful about what I allow to be broken up, how much, and that it's not creating a pattern that I don't want. Right, because if I if I let it if I allow it to be broken up exactly the same everywhere, then it creates a pattern that looks like it was applied by brush, and that's not what I want. I want it to look very natural. So I'll go back in after I've got this pushed around, just clean up anything that I feel um, has started to look um, like it's a it's a character of the brush rather than the nature of the, the um, of the cuff. And again, once I've got that down, then I'll, I'll just be able to go in with a fan brush, kind of dust over this, and um, that'll help to level things out a little bit as well. And again, like for me, I'm not, I'm actually going in and I'm doing it. So I did a little bit of an area. I've got these little variations, and I'm going in and cleaning them up. I'm not gonna do the entire thing create a ton of work in re as repair, and then do all the repair. I do a little bit at a time. That way I don't wind up with too much repair work at the end. They're kind of doing it all as I go. I've found that if you build up too much stuff that needs to be repaired at the end, the repair work tends to get sloppy. And so, and, and again, that, that's for me. Um, you may be different, you may have no problem cordoning something off and like, you know, doing all of this and then creating, you know, 40 minutes of repair work and then kind of hunkering down and doing that. I, I find that psychologically, I don't like the way it feels. I prefer to, I prefer to um, kind of clean up as I go. I will only allow so much of a mess to creep in here before I have to go in and clean it up and make better sense of it. I, did, I just don't like, I don't like facing a mess at the end of the painting process. Um, so, I'm gonna clean up as I go. And it's not, it's not every single stroke, but I'll get like maybe an inch, and maybe two inches done, and then go back and clean up. Then I'll do the next two inches, and then go back and clean up. So. Got some comments here. Yes. From Kathy Renio, one of our new students. Yes. I love Ke I love Kevin's explanations. He's so thorough and precise. To use his own term, he doesn't leave us with any fuzzy edges about his meaning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I do my best. I do my best. And um, Mark Moody about the um, was it differential geography? Uh, geometry. 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 Right. Yes. Mark Moody says, you're welcome, was a navigator in the Coast Guard. We used differential geometry all the time. There you go. <laughs> Year, a couple of years ago, I, I, I told Daniel, I think I said to him that I'm in the school, I'm never wrong. And I used this as a thing to show him how, what he thought and what was so was not necessarily the case. And of course, you can imagine the look on his face. He, he thought I was full of it. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, thank you very much. I appreciate I appreciate you letting me uh, giving me the time to correct myself. I don't have a, you know one of the things is like for me I don't have a problem being wrong, but if I'm wrong and I and I find out that I am I correct it, and it's uh, like even in this I'm doing this I make mistakes. I have no problem admitting them in real time so you can see it. I think. Um, you know, when I was working on the, the shirt and the tie, I was, I was struggling a little bit. <clears throat> and rather than just kind of keep it to myself um, and just kind of push through it, I decided to vocalize what, I, what was going on in my head, right? Because you can see, if you watch that part of the video, you can see a little bit of frustration there. 
like I'm working. And not, not like, like I'm pulling out my hair, but I was struggling to see, I couldn't figure things out. Um, and so I know that I'll get around it, I just need to like keep a level head and kind of work my way through. But I want everybody to see, I want everybody to see that what I'm doing and what you're doing at home, when you're struggling, the pros struggle. If they're not struggling, they're not producing anything meaningful. You struggle because you're, you're pushing the envelope, right? You're pushing the envelope of your knowledge regardless of how much knowledge you have. And I think, I think professionals do people a disservice that they're trying to show, to teach, to, to educate, to help. They do them a disservice when they give the impression that it just rolls off the brush. I fight the same fight that anybody who picks up a paintbrush does. I might have more experience, I might have more knowledge, but the fight is the same fight. And the struggles are just as real for me as they are for anybody else. And I think that makes people who are learning, who are struggling with things, one, it gives them, it gives them a better framework for understanding that they're not alone. And I think that's a big thing. Like when you think that other people can just sit down and just, it just happens, you start to wonder if you've actually got a gift for them, you know, talent and gifts and all that nonsense. You start to wonder if maybe you just don't have that because everybody else seems to make it look so easy. But you're not, he you're not hearing what's going on in their head. You're not hearing them like, oh, that's not the red I want. Especially if they're doing a demonstration. They're hiding that. I, I, prefer, I prefer to be a little bit more, a little bit more honest and a little bit more straightforward because from the standpoint of teaching it, it helps you to know that that struggle that you're, that you're fighting, it's not you and you alone. That it belongs to everybody, and I don't care how good you are, how long you've been doing it, everybody has that struggle. And so that struggle makes you part, it makes you part of this tradition. You know, everybody from Michelangelo all the way up, or all the way down, um, it's all the same fight. And so knowing that, that you're just dealing with the same struggle that Da Vinci and Michelangelo and, and all these David, all these great painters, even the person teaching you, go through. I think it makes it easier for people to, to get through the hard times, the things they're struggling with, knowing they're not alone, right? It, you know, you can work, it's funny, we find in the Evolve program, students like to jump into the homework rooms and hang out with each other so they're in a community. But there is more than that as a community. There's the community where you're in a room talking to people, even if it's virtual, and there's community where you know that you are dealing with a common scenario, right? I know that when I sit down and I work and I struggle, Michelangelo struggled too, Da Vinci struggled too, David struggled too, like all of them struggled too. That, that, I'm in a community of people who struggled their entire life doing what they're doing. And it, in those hard times, it, it, it bolsters my resolve, reminds me to not get, like, so frustrated that I lose focus. There's a community in that. You know, we get to, we get to struggle together, not just in, in space, but through time. Knowing that, that nobody, nobody has ever been so good that they didn't struggle. And I can tell you, um, one of my favorite quotes from Michelangelo, and uh, I'll paraphrase it. Um, I really need to learn this. I need to get the quote down perfectly because I love it. But basically, Michelangelo, he was producing master grade drawings at about 12 years old, right? Just to frame his life. Master grade drawings at about 12 years old, and he died at 89. He lived a long life. And I mean, everybody knows what he produced in his life. He is widely regarded as the greatest artist who's ever lived. The, the quality of his work and the breadth of it. I mean, just, he did everything. He was an architect and he was a sculptor and he was a painter. And he's just, just incredible on all fronts. And he said, um, just before his death, that one of his regrets, one of his great regrets in life was that he had just learned the alphabet of his trade. I mean, that's daunting to think that at 12 years old, he was producing work of, of a master level and he continued to set the, the standard for excellence in his time during the Renaissance, lived to be just shy of 90, and felt at that point that he had just really kind of got a grasp of the basics. I mean, the alphabet of his trade, not expertise, the alphabet of his trade at 89 years old. It tells you the struggle is real and, it, and everybody has it. 
And I think that's I think that's a great thing to know, and it's a great thing to share as a teacher. It makes you it makes you human, I think. And I think that human to human connect, connection helps to to bridge the gap in education. If you're learning from somebody who you put up on a pedestal, it's easy to say, well, they can do that because they're up on a pedestal and I can't because I'm down here on the ground. But if you see them as a peer, regardless of where they are on the path, if you see them as an equal, which you should, then it, it, it makes what they do attainable. I think when you start talking about old masters and you kind of put them up on those pedestals, you, you cut off your access to that end of your potential because you start to get it in your head that what they did can't be attained because they were something special instead of them solving the same problems that you solve every time you step in front of a canvas. Question. Yes. Why are you not using a full picture of the cuff? It's just, too, I, you know, okay. Well, first of all, I keep not printing full-size prints. But this is basically the cuff. There's a little bit, I cut it because I was doing the glove and this image didn't fit. I don't, there's really nothing out here. So I'm good, I have all the details that I need and I know where the shadow ends. So I don't really need it, but technically I should have an image that's a one-to-one -one match. But yeah, I've said this like every single day when I've come in that I need to run prints of full scale. I'm, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's terrible. I should have an, a one-to-one -one relationship here, side by side for this. Um, I'm just, I just keep forgetting when I get home. I have other things that I do when I get home. And, um, and so I'm just dropping the ball. And it is making my job more difficult, which is another thing, which like I know better. It's making my job more difficult um, in some areas, like not in this, but like in the flag, made it much more difficult. In the metals, I actually printed it full scale because there's just too much going on. There's just too much going on and to weed through it. It's not that I can't figure it out, but I can, I can only produce, right? My, my reference material is my starting point. From the reference material, I decide which things to put in, which not. But if the reference material isn't giving me the data for me to make the decisions, I'm winging it. And I don't want to do that here. And your reference material is very important when you work. It sets the stage. And it's not to be copying it necessarily mark for mark, but it sets the stage for you. It is the point of departure that your, your, your painting is built from. Just trying to make sure that I'm not missing anything as I go. So I've got my basic shapes in. Uh, and remember, all this gold that's in here is going to be the shadows. I'm going to then build lights around, um, around it, which is going to then pull this stuff out. But I want to make sure that I've got everything here well defined. Uh, these are now the boundaries of all of these decorative elements. So I want to make sure that they're well defined, um, that I've not missed anything, that everything feels solid in here. I don't want it to come back in and put more purple in later on. So I want to make sure all of these shapes are making sense. I want to just be able to glaze this later. And so I'm literally now going each one, looking to see that the shape um, 
falls in line with what I want it to be. And then I've not left anything out. Right, I'm literally just edge to edge. I'm just following the photograph, looking to make sure that I've not missed anything. Changing some of the shapes as I go, pushing in trying to make sure the stem feels right, that it's the same width the whole way. In my transfer, there were some inconsistencies, and so I'm cleaning them up at this stage. And again, I actually find it easier to do that with the brush than with the, with the pencil when I do the transfer. It's good. Once I've got the shadow in, then I'll be able to just drop in the light around it, and that'll pull the cuff together. I could take this shadow and I can outline. So this cast shadows on the bottoms of all these. I could put those in now. It's easier to glaze them in, and so I'm going to leave it for that stage. But I could, I could actually drop them in now if I wanted to. It would give a little bit more dimension to the painting like right now, but it's not necessary. It'll be easier actually to put in later on. Some of these openings, even though they're sitting on the lit side, are completely shadowed by the gold relief. So I'll, I'll drop those in. Gonna take a small fan brush and knock this stuff down, make sure it's clean, and then I'll move on to the lit side. Again, I'm not so much worried about like like some of this is gonna get brushed over and it's gonna spread out into the gold, but a lot of this is gonna be shadow, a little bit of air, a little bit of that's not gonna make a big deal, and a lot of it's gonna be lit, which I'm gonna be painting in those lights right on top and it'll bury it. So I, don't, I want to be careful not to make a mess, but at the same time, I'm just looking to just take the edges down, make sure everything is smooth and even. Um, I'll clean up anything that I feel isn't, um, isn't clean enough. 
anything that needs something a little bit more solid. Like I know the ridge of this has a highlight on it, so I'm gonna be able to drop lights in there and clean up little, little variations on this edge. But again, it's, all, it's actually playing pretty nicely. That glaze that went down is actually, it's just, just sticky enough that the paint is playing beautifully with it. Um, it's not it's not oily or slick. Good. So I can now switch over, grab a different brush, and I'll do my lights. And again, just a little bit of medium in the paint. Just enough to loosen it up. I'll start building in my lines. And this at the moment, because it's surrounded by so much orange gold, is going to look very, very purple. Um, once most of the gold is buried, it won't be, it won't look so, it won't look quite so day glow. Again, I'm going to bump up against the shadow's edge. I'll be, I'll probably create another value and be, I'll mix these two together, the shadow and the light, in order to um, marry them together. And I'll just do that, I'll do that in here afterwards rather than just smudge them together here, I'll, uh, I'll create a new shade in between. Um, basically, I mean, those of you who are in the program, I would create a buffer and then break down the edge that way. transfer I'm getting rid of now I'm cleaning up and I'm making it fit what I want it to look like again the transfer transfer is not always going to be precise it's precise enough it's good for some things not good for others but in the end if you look at something in a transfer you don't like the way it looks you change it you make right because you trust your eyes um, your eyes are a very precise tool Learning to trust them is, is the key. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at the reference material, if something looks like it, like if you see something wrong with something in, in, the, in your transfer, assume that it's wrong. Don't just paint it because, well, I did the transfer and it must be right. Right? Make the change. Trust, trust your eyes that if they're seeing something that doesn't look right, chances are something's not right. Just because you made a mark um, as a trace doesn't mean that the mark is where it belongs or that it does a good job of describing what you're actually seeing with your eyes. So, a big part of making art is learning to trust your instincts. Right, we don't trust them when we have no skills. But as we develop our skills, we learn that our, our ability to assess things, our, our visual responses to things, uh, our intu intuitive response to things that, that if we'll find with a little bit of skill to, that's developed them, that they actually guide us very well. The hard part is learning to trust them when you have tools that you can use that seem more precise. The idea is that we want to get away from leaning on tools. We want to have, basically, if you were dropped on a desert island, 
anything that could make a mark, you could make art with, if you have the skills. If you require tools, if you've gotten so comfortable leaning on tools, um, and you don't have them, you can't make art. And so we don't want to find ourselves, and again, obviously, most of us will never find ourselves deserted on a, uh, on a desert island somewhere, but the idea is the same. You don't want to, you, you don't want to be dependent on something in order to be able to produce art, because what happens when that thing is no longer available? What happens when you want to do something, but you don't have that tool in hand? You're dependent on it, and, um, and so you can't create. Just so you know, we're getting some low volume comments. Okay. So just friendly reminder to speak up where you okay. can. I will do my best. <clears throat> Daniel, do you have the um, the link for the block one videos that we just released? I, I do not. I think that um, Mitch sent them in uh, WhatsApp. Just check. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Dan is going to post in here. So, um, for those of you who are not um, enrolled in Evolve, we are actually releasing a couple of the Block One videos so that you can get a sense of how the program works. Um, you can see the the beginnings of the education, um, how we assess shades of gray, like how we think about that, how we break down shadow and light, then also how we. Um, how we assess sharp and graded edges. And again, it's formulaic to start, but it'll give you, <clears throat> it'll give you an opportunity to um, see what the education looks like if you are curious. Um, so we've had a number of people who have been watching the videos who have jumped in and signed up for the program, but we, um, we'd like to make it available so that you can see it. there's no cost. Um, Daniel's gonna drop a link in the, um, uh, down below, and feel free to go check it out. If you have any questions about it, I'm here for the next few weeks. But at least it'll give you an idea of how we how we actually teach this, the beginnings. Like obviously what you'll be looking at is grayscale, but that's how the program starts. You'll be able to make some sense of it. being coerced into telling you that the reason why the volume is low is because of your jersey and that it's causing all the interference. <laughs> I, you know what I meant to take it off? It, the heat was off in here when I first came in and so the place has to get warmed up. Um, I'm sure the jersey will be off at some point. It's starting to get warm in here. I was cold the other day um, when I was working. so.
one of the nice things about um, putting in the purple is that it does two jobs. It fills the space with the color that belongs there, but it also then cordons off and starts to give the impression of the details of the gold. So, and again, this was a decision that I made at the very beginning. Originally, I was gonna put the purple and the gold in in the first pass, and I changed my mind and I thought, well, you know, this might be a nicer way of doing it. Um, and so, kind of liking the way that it's going right now. I don't think, either way, I don't think it would have been any more work. I'm kind of liking that I'm seeing some of the gold through the shadow and through the light. It's helping to, to make the cuff and the gold that's going to be decorated on it, kind of hold them together and make them feel like they're um, one thing. I'm trying to make sure I'm not getting any blobs of paint down here. I'm trying to control the amount of paint on my brush. That. That's something actually, so before I was talking about how I wouldn't play around with different types of mediums and <clears throat> because we want consistent result, we don't want to have any, um, anything jump into the process that messes us up, right? And so one of the things, um, and you won't, you won't see it in the videos that are posted because we, we skip over like how the block one videos that we're putting out, they skip over how to hold a brush and how to pick up paint, because we actually start there. Uh, but in those earlier videos, one of the things I talk about is that every time you grab paint from your palette, it should be the same amount of paint. That way you can anticipate exactly what the stroke is gonna look like. And so in here, I don't have any blobs of paint, because every time I grab paint, it's about the same amount. And I'm able to control, um, I'm able to control what's going down, because I know how much paint is on the brush because it's the same every time. And again, I'm, I'm eliminating um, variables. I'm eliminating the potential chaos that comes from every stroke, me having to figure out how much paint is on the brush and hitting the canvas with each stroke. If I know that it's the same every time, I get used to it as I go, not just in this painting, but across every painting I do. And so it gives me some stability in the process that might otherwise not be there. And it doesn't mean that I don't accidentally sometimes grab more than I intend. But the thing is, if I do 10,000 strokes for this painting today, and 9,500 of them are the same amount of paint, there's no problems with any of those strokes. The other 500, yeah, maybe there's some issues, but that's a very small, that's a very small um, grouping of potential problems, where if every stroke is potentially different, there's potentially 10,000 problems, um, 10,000 variants that'll have to be dealt with. So I want to avoid that if I can, and metering the amount of paint is the start of that. Every stroke goes down and it's basically the same. And that doesn't mean that I can't vary them, like from, from thing to thing. But if I do the jacket, the strokes are all the same. If I do the cuff, those strokes are all the same. The glove, those strokes are all the same. They're not varied amounts of paint. You don't see me scooping paint and kind of having to then push it around once it's down. I get just enough paint to do what I intend. It goes a very small area. Like you see me back and forth and back and forth to the palette. Um, I'm taking only the paint off the palette that I need for the mark that I'm making and nothing more. I'm going to give everyone a closer look at what you're doing. Someone on your right side.
And so I added the shadow and the light together, and I'm just gonna put this down on this edge, and it's gonna make it possible for me to dissolve the edge. Uh, so the purple in this color value, into this color value, is not gonna play nicely. But if I mix them together and I create a middle ground, this will blend on this edge, this will blend on this edge. This is gonna make it easier to make a rich gradient that way. Um, otherwise, where the, um, where the shadow and the light meet will very likely turn into kind of like a mud. And that's a typical problem that people run into with oil paint. A lot of transition areas turn into mud um, as they work. And what it is is that you don't have peer-to-peer -peer relationships with the, with the values and the colors. This, this takes care of that problem. All right, so the shadow and the light, the light here and the shadow here, will actually never touch. I'll marry this edge here and this edge here, but I'll leave this barrier sitting in between, and it'll be a natural transition because it is a mixture from the two shades, the shadow and the light. All right, and so again, for those of you who are in the program, that would function as a buffer. I could then create another shade, mixing the buffer with the shadow, and take this edge down. Because the values are so close, I can really just kind of nudge the edge together and it'll be fine. So I'm gonna do all my shadow signs first. Again, just dissolve the edge by pushing the paint together. Again, because the paint has all gone down with about the same amount of paint in every stroke, one thing doesn't overtake another because one is thicker than another. So I just wipe my brush. I'll do the same on the lit side. Just, just taking the edge down, just nudging it. And I get my gradients. Now, they're not, they're not really smooth, but I'll take care of that when I go on the fan brush later on be able to smooth them out. In fact, I think I'm going to do that now, and then I'll, then I'll just block in the rest. I'll do the, again, this is kind of cleanup work with a fan brush. So I'm going to soften all these edges, and then I'll go in and I'll do my, my gradients. Right, that way I don't have any, any excess purple floating around up here. And again, very gentle. Just trying to make sure it's generally smooth. There are no ridges or anything. Very easy when you're kind of going around these shapes to create ridges. I don't want that. Just trying to balance the stuff out. Make it feel smooth. The gold is trying to kind of push its way back through. Um, so I want to make sure that the gold, that the gold isn't, isn't showing through in any solid way. I mean, it can be present to a degree, but I don't want it to, I don't want it to start breaking up the, the violet. There are little places where it peeks through. So here now I'm just gonna play on the edge where the where the buffer and the light meet. And that's gonna dissolve that edge for me beautifully. I don't have to do very much. Again, because these, these shades they're very close together and they're made from a combination of two colors that I'm trying to blend. So they play nicely together. I'll now um,
from Alan. I'm guessing this is how you can reduce the shades in value from 11 to 4 because you blend them into each other? Yes. So if I have a, so let's say I have a, um, a 10 and a 1, black and white, and I try to mix them, you wind up with a real mess in the middle. If I, build, if I create a mixture between the 10 and the 1 and make a 5, I can put the 10 and the 1 side by side and then put the 5 in between them. Now instead of it being a 10 value jump to blend from 10 to 1, I'm now looking at a 5 value jump from 10 to 5, and a, 10, a 5 value jump from 1 to 5. If the 5 is still too much of a jump, I can make a 7.5. The 7.5, the 5 blends into the 7.5 pretty easily. The 10 blends into the 7.5. On the other side, the 1 blends into a 2.5 pretty easily. The 2.5 into the 5 pretty easily. If that's too much, I would then create increments in between those. But that's the general idea. And you're not going to have a 10 to a 1. You'll have like a 7 to a 3, right? So you make a 5, which is what I did. You would then, it, like in this case, the 5 is close enough between the 7 and the 3. The 5 is enough that I could knock the edges down. But technically, the better way to do it is to put the 5 down as a buffer in between the 7 and 3, and then make a 4 as the vehicle to take out the edge between the five and the three, and then make a six to take out the edge between the five and the seven, right? Because then you're actually building in the values that bridge the gap rather than trying to mush one thing into another and kind of mix them on the palette. I mean, mix them on the painter. You'll always get a nicer gradient if you do the extra work of making the additional shades. Again, I know what's going to go on top of this, so I know I know how much margin I have here. This doesn't have to be butter smooth because I'm going to be building on top of it in the next layer, and there's going to be a lot of detail in here that's going to hide any of this stuff that's a little bit harsh. There's something there's something like in here. It's you've got some creases in here. You're not really seeing them probably at that scale, but there are some creases in here. They're not perfect gradients. And so you do have some jumps that explain some of the, the, the density of the material. And so leaving some of this stuff intact, it's not going to be front and center because it's going to be buried behind these very, very bright lights that are going to get laid in on top. That's really what you're going to see. This becomes underpinning. If it's too soft, it kind of loses its form. And the form of the overall purple cuff helps to explain the form of the decorations on top, right? And so I want to make sure that I'm not wiping it away completely. And it's very easy to go and, and push it too far. So I am, like, it was a decision, not out of laziness, but out of where I know I want this to be, where it's going, what's going to go on top of it, what this needs to describe with, the de with the, all the detailed work that's going to go on top. Uh, so I'm, I'm calculating that as I go. But if I needed this to be smoother, I would, have I would have actually created the values in between the original light and the buffer and the original shadow and the buffer, and I would have used those to actually grade the edges between. You know, like I said, I'm seeing some of the gold kind of pushing through. It's gold. It's, it's, it's a very dark um, tan. And so um, I don't mind peeking through again. It helps to unify the purple cup with the gold. Um, and some of, it, some of it that's showing through right now will be buried when I glaze the final purple or violet on top of this. 
Um, but I don't mind a little bit of that variation peeking through. Um, it just, it helps to connect one thing to another. Because I don't want it to feel like each thing is its own thing. I want it to feel like it's all part of the, the whole. Not just the, the cuff and the purple, but everything in the painting. It's kind of merged with everything else to a degree. And so if everything is too pristine and it all is just what it is, the painting starts to feel like just a collection of ideas that don't necessarily marry. And we want to try to avoid that. And it, though it works in the photograph, it doesn't necessarily work in the painting. Uh, that's another thing, like when you paint, the photograph, your brain knows that it's mechanically created. Like this is actually important. Your brain knows that the photograph is mechanically created, so it is not flawed. It represents what it sees without any error because it's mechanical. You press a button and the image is recorded. The painting, when you look at it, can be potentially flawed even, even if well, your brain, you can see the flaws in a painting that is an exact replica of a photograph. So the photograph is taken with a camera with a single eye. And so it, it compresses the image, it strips away the three dimensions, it does a lot of things that are actually not, they don't line up with the way we see, the way that we perceive. And so your eyes would see it differently. When we look at things in the real world, we see them one way, a camera sees them another, but our brain accepts the photograph as being correct, even though our brain knows better than what it's looking at. It knows that the photograph is, doesn't have opinion in it. It's a mechanical process. And so we accept the photograph, even though the photograph doesn't look anything like the real world. I mean, it's really funny how far off from the real world photographs look, but we believe in them. And so because we believe in them, um, our brain accepts them fills in blanks, all kinds of other stuff. But when we make a painting, if we make a painting, so like as an example, you take a photograph of a really crazy sky, sunset with kind of weird clouds, you paint it exactly the way the photograph looks, it doesn't look real, but the photograph does. The photograph you believe, but the painting you'd be like, there's no way. And your brain just won't, won't accept it. Same thing with stuff with this, like the hand. This hand kind of looks funny, it's an odd shape. I'm gonna to have to work on that hand to better explain the structure of the bones underneath in order for the hand to not look just like a kind of a mushy blob of white floating in the middle of the painting. If I paint only what I see and not what I know, that hand's not gonna work. This one is fine, but this one isn't. This one, there's enough information, it feels like fingers, but this is just a blob. The photograph looks like a blob, the painting looks like a blob. I need to work on that, I need to do more. Um, and so when I'm looking at the purple and it only looks like purple here, me being okay with the gold showing through is based on my understanding that we wouldn't see it in a, such a pristine way. It doesn't, everything in the world that we see kind of marries together and it makes sense as a whole. And if I'm not unifying the colors and, and organizing them in a way that is easier to read and makes sense and make sure that one thing doesn't feel completely separate from the things around it, as the photograph might make it look, it won't feel like a cohesive thing. It won't feel like a painting. It'll feel like a bunch of paintings kind of glued together. And so allowing these little variations, these little, what we think of as imperfections into the painting, and they're only imperfect relative to the photographic reference, we start to breathe in a little bit of the, um, the reality of life, right? And again, if this is too perfect, it, nothing in the world is that perfect. So we break it up a little bit. We connect it to the things around it so that it feels like it's part of something bigger. Then it doesn't have to stand on its own. It is supported and supports all of the things around it. And the painting is, in order for a painting to be successful, it has to do that. So you have to be able to depart from your reference material. And again, experience, not just experience in front of an easel, but experience looking at other successful paintings to see how they're done will, will give you guidance on. Mark Moody says, careful, Kevin, you're talking like a plein air painter. <laughs> I have a lot of respect for people who paint outside, you know? It's, uh, there's, um, 
there's a very particular skill set that has to be developed. Um, command of color, understanding the light in the space. I mean, there's a lot. The light, the light source moves on you all day long while you work. That's, that's a big deal. Personally, I prefer like it stays exactly where it is the whole time. Um, but yeah, I mean, plein air painting is great. And I think everybody should do it. There's an education in it. You learn a lot by doing it. And that's the case with everything. You know, if you, if you only paint in your studio, you're missing, you're missing a comp an entire avenue of information um, that's out there to be had. Doing plein air painting will make you a better studio painter. Sculpting will make you a better painter. Because sculpting requires three-dimensional thinking. When we paint on a canvas, unless we have been taught to think in three dimensions, we only have a two-dimensional space to work in. So we tend to think two-dimensionally. We translate the three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional thing. But when you sculpt, you have to think in terms of three dimensions. You can't think of just what's in front, but the depth. And so if you already think that way because you sculpt, when you paint, you think that way, the translation from three dimensions down to two dimensions holds more three-dimensional thinking in it. But you wouldn't be able to do that, you wouldn't understand that, unless you had sculpted in three dimensions. And so the experience is, is important to your growth as an artist. You know, there aren't, there aren't a lot of things out there from an art standpoint that I haven't done, experimented with, and even if it's just, just to get an idea of what it has to offer. Because, you know, like, if you paint in a studio, in the studio alone, when you go outside and you do plein air painting, you'll realize that you have some serious deficiencies in your ability to um, adjust what you think and what you see on the fly. And so, like to give you an example, if I go outside and I paint, I automatically, whatever I think the right color and value is, I bump it up two to three values. And there's two reasons for it. One, in studio, um, shadows tend to plug up and they become very gray. Where outside, and they become gray because the light is going in one direction and hitting the subject, and you have very little ambient light bouncing off of walls filling the other side. So the absence of light equals the absence of um, color. The shadows tend to be much darker also because of the lack of light bouncing back into them. You go outside, everything is so much more colorful because you have sunlight hitting a subject. The shadowed side has ambient sunlight bouncing into it as well. So the discrepancy between the light and the shadow is much shorter. You don't have a five value jump from shadow to light, you have a three value or a two value jump, it's not much. You still have the drop off in color, but even the drop off in color, there's so much ambient light that the amount of color in the shadows is still pretty colorful. And the amount of color in the lights is really kind of ramped up. Also the difference in temperature shifts outdoors. Your shadows are all going to be cooled down with blue and your lights are gonna be nice and warm. Assuming that you have a relatively sunny day. You have these really warm um, kind of golden greens in the light and you're gonna have these kind of bluish greens in, in the shadows, right? And so you have to think about your colors and be very thoughtful about your temperatures, more so than you would need to be in studio. Um, the, 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 the difference between them is so drastic outside. Also, you bear in mind that if you are painting under sunlight, when you take that painting indoors and put it under a regular light source, that's nothing like the amount of light generated by the sun, that painting is gonna look awfully dark. So I generally start with the idea that three values brighter and a higher color, a higher chroma, right? And generally when I'm working outside, a painting will feel way over the top. And then I bring it inside and it's actually nowhere near what I thought it was. And so, uh, but again, you wouldn't understand that if you don't go out and work outside. And once you work outside, that then fills in additional gaps. So when you come back into the studio and you paint a figure from life and you see those dark gray plugged up shadows, your experience from outside tells you how you could elevate them. Gives you an idea of what you can do with them that you wouldn't have if you only stayed in the studio when you're in your safe space. We want to get out into the world and, and experiment with these things because each one of them broadens our horizons 
um, where art making is concerned. And the broader our horizons, the more language we have with which to describe what we want to describe. Right? And that's really, that's really what we're trying to do as artists. We're trying to describe to the world what we see. And the better you are at, at your command of the language, and again, it's the fundamentals, the better your command is, the better you'll be at explaining visually to anyone looking at your work what, you, what it is you're trying to express. There's a, um, there's a, a great short story. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the short story, but the name of it. It was, it was written by um, Harlan Ellison. He's an incredible author um, with an amazing career. But, um, <clears throat> but Harlan Ellison, he wrote a, story, a short story called I Have No Mouth But I Must Scream. I think that's the title of it. And I always think of that when I, when I see artists who don't have a command of fundamentals that they're trying to express themselves and they don't have the mouth with which to do it. And I imagine, imagine the frustration of trying to scream without a mouth. Like, like trying to get that out. You know, when you're a creative person, the need to create is there. And it never goes away. You may be able to put it aside for a time, but it comes back, it always comes back. And, you know, just the idea of being limited by your own ability to make a sound to be able to express yourself, to have those things locked inside of you, unable to get them out. It just, it just it strikes me that it would be torture. And to have a lifetime of that experience, sometimes you kind of get a hint of being able to express what you mean, and then other times not so much so. You can't consistently describe visually to the world what you want. I think just, um, you can see it with little children. When they're trying to explain something, and they don't have the vocabulary to express what they're trying to say. They know what they want to say, but they don't have the words. And you can see them get so frustrated. And I imagine, like as an artist, not having the language with which to describe what is in here, what's in here, not being able to get it out is is just is just awful. knock this stuff down and then I think I'm kind of ready to move on to the next thing. I'm gonna soften that edge a little bit. Um, the values are not that far apart and I can, I can almost get away with it the way it is. But I, again, always going back to the same thing. I have to make a decision as to whether or not that's going to force me in the next pass to a place I don't necessarily want to be. And I'm not sure what that edge is going to look like in the final painting. If it's too flat, it's not going to feel like it goes around his arm. And so my next pass potentially makes it even sharper. And so um, that's the nature of glazing. Um, it runs the risk of making it even sharper and then, then it'll look like a cutout on the top. And that I can't have. Um, that cannot be in the painting. That would, go, that would push it a little too far and it become graphic rather than feeling like it, like it has um, volume. And again, I'm not even really worried about getting in and out of the gold. If the gold is a little disrupted, when I put all my lights in, it's all going to get buried or be broken up. So you're not going to see these errant strokes. They're not going to feel that way in the final painting. 
And a couple of them, one here, one there, is not going to degrade the painting at all. Again, it just helps to unify what's going on here. So again, this is making sure that I don't have any blobs of paint, and it's also helping to knock down some of the edges where the purple is bumping up against the gold. And then just a little bit back and forth. Remember, I'm just waiting to see those edges give way. The moment that they give way, I'll stop. This edge, like this, I can leave sharp. Same with this, because those the gold that's going to go in there is going to overwrite that edge. Um, so I don't have to go crazy about knocking it down. This, there's a lot of stuff that's going to stay just the way it is. Um, but down here and up here, I can get away with the edge being left pretty sharp. I don't want to make sure I don't have a ridge where the paint is like built up. Um, but I don't have to go too crazy about knocking it down because it is going to get overridden when I put the gold in. It's nice. It comes right up because of the because the the painting is sealed. So now I've just got to clean up this edge up here. So I'm going to use right. So remember, this and this are basically the same. They're about the same value um, and very similar in color. What I have here is a little bit darker, right? I didn't I didn't make it exactly the same. I just got it into the ballpark. So if I use that intermediate value, that buffer value on this edge, I should be able to round the edge, right? It's gonna be, be a clean, precise stroke, but I should be able to round that edge. I say round the edge, I'm just looking to take the crispness away. And you can see there's a stroke in there that's lighter, darker than this, but lighter than this. And so it functions to, to, to take the edge down. I don't even need to really break it down much further than this. Um, I can probably leave it just the way it is. Um, because when I come back in and glaze and I put this darks in. Coming over here. Yeah, so you can see the thickness of it. I mean, it's right. It's in here. It's a little thinner. It's getting a little thicker out here. Um, I just touched the painting, but it falls in between this shade and this shade. So, so it's it's visually, especially from a couple of feet away, it's going to marry the two. Now I can go in and I can actually make additional values if I want. to really, like I could drop this shade at the top here and soften the edge there, and I can make a mixture between the light purple and that shade, which is, I'm actually going to make, make a value that just has a little bit more of the light purple in it and soften the edge on the bottom. I'm not gonna worry about the edge against the jacket because the edge against the jacket, when I glaze the jacket and I drop those darks in, I can clean that edge up at that point. I'll be able to bury, I'll be able to bury whatever is there. Right? And again, I'm using the mall stick. It gives me a little bit of precision. 
that my hand might not otherwise have. All right, and all I did is basically dissolve the edge. That, there's a little bit of lighter value in there, but again, I'm not gonna worry about the top edge. You can see it's now, it feels softer. When I go in and I glaze in the jacket, I'll be able to clean that edge up. Um, it'll be very simple. I'll just overlap the shadow into this edge a little bit more and then just feather it out. Like I said, it'll make sense when I do it, but that's, that's good. Um, that should work very nicely for me. The shadow shade that I have from the cuff is darker than this. So if I put it in there, it's gonna create a dark outline and I don't want that. So I wanna stay away from that. I'm just gonna, yeah, I mean, I'm feeling good about that. So I'm gonna leave it just like that. I'm not gonna do anything else with it. Uh, and I can now move on to, I'll do the collar now. Right, the collar, the collar is pretty much all shadow and a couple of little hits of light around the edges. So I can actually just paint everything in in the darker shade and then drop a couple of little lights in on it, which is what I'm going to do. Um, and that's going to, again, simplify the process for me. It's going to make it so that I'm, I'm not trying to figure out every little in and out. I'm generalizing and then I'll pull a few details out. And you can see, if you step back away, you can see the impact of that cuff with the gold kind of showing through. It's starting, you know, it's, again, it's yet another thing that's solidifying the painting. Again, remember, we don't have any lights in yet or any, any, any highlights. Everything here is all very neutral right now. These things got to become much more dynamic. The top of this is lit, the bottom is shadowed, so the shadow's gonna stay dark and in the gold, and then the lights will be dropped in, and here these are gonna become very, very bright, right? Not quite as light as this, but it's gonna be much lighter. And I'm literally gonna be able to just drop in literally strokes just on top of it. It should, even though it's a lot of individual strokes, it might be 20 or 30 strokes per leaf, they're not gonna take very long. They'll go down very thin, they're not gonna be blended, they're just literally gonna be just mark, mark, almost like with a pencil, one after another. Um, so the decorative elements in this, um, though they will be tedious, shouldn't take that long. Like I've laid it, I've built this up pretty well, so that the amount of work to finish it off should be limited. It shouldn't be multiple layers, or it'll be one layer which puts all the details in, maybe a glaze to make sure all the colors unify, and then a few highlights on top of it. It, it could take three more passes to finish this, there or about. Again, I won't know until I'm actually doing it, really what it, what it demands. Um, but <clears throat> get, it'll, get, it'll get figured out as I'm doing it. Okay. Ken Conley was saying that the sound is much better when the camera's closer. Do we want to reposition it? Yeah, absolutely. Is this okay? You want it further, further back? Um, a little bit further back. Good? Yeah, that's fine. Question. Yes. Is the person of whom you are painting <coughs> watching this? I do not believe so. I do not believe so. Okay, so what I'm seeing. Actually, no, I'm good. I was gonna say that the 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 um, the collar on this side is actually lighter than the jacket. And so putting in my darkest shade here is going to make the collar look darker than the jacket, but I'm pushing the jacket back in the next pass, so I'm not going to worry about it. I was originally thinking, like just now, I was thinking, well, if I, if I add a little bit more of the light purple to this, then it gets a little bit lighter and it'll be more obvious. Um, 
again, I'm playing this value against this. This is lighter than this. I think I'm actually going to add a little bit of the light purple into it, just so that I can see it better, that I can see it's purple. This collar is everywhere that you see it is purple. And right now my shadows don't read as purple. So I'm gonna make the adjustment so the whole collar feels purple even in the shadows. I'm just gonna take just a minute and just kind of play with that collar. And again, you see, I mean, I'm making decisions on the fly. Like as I'm working, I'm, I'm critically viewing what's going on at every step, trying to figure out how to best describe. I, I don't just accept because I did something and I, and I started down one path that it's necessarily the way to go. I want to constantly be reassessing. And so, not that, not that just going with what I did here, up in here, would hurt, but it might make more, like it's not gonna damage the painting, but it might make more work than I need to do. And I don't wanna do more work than is necessary, right? The idea is to get the best result possible with the least amount of work. I never wanna sacrifice quality to make up some time. Quality is always the starting, is the standard. Right, so, but I don't want to spend time doing something and then have to do, say, two passes on top of it when if I had been a little bit more thoughtful at the beginning, one pass would have sufficed, right? And so I want to be thoughtful in that way because it saves me, it saves me the grief of, um, it saves me the grief of having to do more work later on. Sure. Here, a little bit more purple. It's a little bit lighter. It's a little bit lighter than the jacket. So this will give me room. Um, it'll give me room to glaze it later on and, and impart a little bit more violet at that time. Again, I'm still kind of playing with the collar a little bit. Make sure my hand is clean before I go resting it on the white shirt. Again, I can wipe it off, but I don't want to make a mess if I don't have to. Um, I am going to go to this brush. So I'm going down to the more detailed, smaller brush to start. Um, there's not a lot of big open spaces in here to fill, so I'm going to stay with the smaller brush. Right. And again, I mean, this is really detail-oriented stuff that I'm doing at this point. Right, the pace at which I'm working is dialed down quite a bit. I've got to make sure that I'm making sense of all of these shapes. I don't want to cover something that needs to be gold. I want to make sure all the things that need to be gold in the final painting are left uncovered. So 
every single piece that I do here is now going to be carefully calculated. Again, once I've got the once I've got the edge done, I can then just paint away from it. But I've got to get the edge done, and it's got to be clean. I've got to again. I'm not going to really mess with these edges once they're down. Being careful not to lay out any blobs of paint. Again, if I lay out a blob of paint accidentally, what happens is in when I start blending it with the fan brush, I potentially drag a large amount of paint from one place to another, obscuring an edge or filling something gold with purple. And I want to try to avoid that. So controlled amounts of paint are going to prevent that problem from happening to, to a large degree. Again, a little bit of carryover, not a big deal. I don't want to have bold strokes of purple burying places um, that are meant to be that are meant to be gold. But at the same time, I need to make sure that I'm filling all the places that are going to be purple. I don't want to leave anything unfilled that needs to be filled. Um, there's another picture of this collar. It's a smaller photograph right here. Thank you. I just need to find that. That's about it. There's a little piece up here. I see that. That's right there on top. Right there on top. There it is. Thank you. Good. So I've got my photographs have been cut up into little pieces here. So I just need to make sense of this. All right. So I just want to see what I've got going on in here. Okay. Here on the tie, I'm giving myself a little bit of breathing room. This up in here will be quite delicate enough to be so careful down here. So I missed the jacket in here. So I'm going to put this in and then I'll drop in the original shape that I made as a shadow for the, for the cuff. In here is the jacket. I, mean, I just want to make sure that I'm, I've got, you know, I won't make any of this up. I'm going to, I'm going to be checking. This photograph ends here, so I'll have another photograph for the rest of this down here. Again, much like I did with the metals um, the other day, I'm just filling in the gaps in here. 
which will help to explain all of the, uh, the jewelry on here a little bit better. It'll make a little more sense of the shapes. Again, not every mark, not everything. I'm, I'm just the ones that are clear and obvious will go in and nothing else. You don't need to put it all in. Um, a lot of this information will be able to be glazed in later on. But this helps me to establish some landmarks. So again, as the drawing disappears, I'll be able to lean on the marks that I've made in the painting. Question? Yes. Is the face tomorrow? The face will be done on Wednesday. I wanted to get a little bit more done around the face. I was originally debating doing it today. Um, as I've mentioned the last week, I was thinking about it, but um, I'm still figuring some things out. The more that's done around the head, the easier it is to make sense of what to do with the head. Um, and again, I mean, that kind of sounds like, I, I don't want to make it sound like I don't know what to do here and I need all these other things done. But the thing is that being one value lighter than it should be, or on a chroma scale, 10% less chromatic or more chromatic than it should be, presents problems later on. The more I can figure out before I do the head, which is the most complex part of a painting, and, the, and obviously the most important part because it's a painting of him, the regalia pales in comparison to the significance of the face being done right. But the, the, the less in the way of problems I can run into on his face, the better it is for me. And so the more of this I tighten up, again, burying some of this gold so it's not so overwhelming, that we have all these other colors in place, makes it easier to frame what the parameters of the face should be in the next pass. And that's why, I'm, why I didn't do it today uh, and why I'm holding off till Wednesday. I wanna make sure all of this purple gets in. And also tomorrow I wanna make sure that Anything else that needs to be adjusted before I do the face, anything else that's jumping out is problematic, that I take the time to get it done before I do the face. And so I've even allowed some of the gold to still creep through from behind in between the, the white of the tie and the, um, and the, the purple collar. So again, I'll see how that plays out as I kind of soften my edges. But for now, I've left a little bit of, there's a, that's a soft enough transition for now. Um, I could leave that the way it is, and I think it would be fine. Um, I'll revisit it as I start moving this paint around um, and blending it smoothing it out. just a matter of opinion and I may decide as I'm working that it doesn't fit but I'll take it out I'll just bury it um, I could do that in the next pass when I glaze or I could do it when I blend but I'm kind of liking it right now I'm liking 
the purple and the gold, they kind of vibrate against each other and having as a barrier in between. It has a bit of charm. Mm -hmm. Alan Yost has been dropping in some comments here. Going back to Kathy Renyo's comment about your ability to explain things, Kevin. Yes. Um, he said, that's what I like about his educational videos. I have some experience painting, but I don't mind going back to basics with him because I really benefit from a methodical approach, which I don't believe I ever got from previous teachers. Knowing the fine details about why and how to do things is extremely helpful and gives me much more confidence. Of course, to be fair from my to be fair to my previous teachers, none of them ever had the chance to spend so much time demonstrating the process as Kevin and the quarantine are giving us. Yeah, there's something to be said, but I actually I discussed that on um, on on uh, Wednesday last week. How you know when you're looking at, or actually, did I describe? Uh, I think I talked about that. You know, when you're looking at an education. Um, you know, I, I do podcasts and I do, I'm talking to people all the time. And so like, sometimes like I'm, I, I can't remember if I spoke, if I spoke here or if I spoke someplace else, but, um, like, so if I already went through this and you've heard it, then just, you know, you know, please bear with me. But you think about when you go and you get an education, like if you go to a college, you have every semester, you have a different painting teacher. Right, so you're there for painting, and every single teacher has a different approach. And some of them are realists, and some of them are abstractionists, and some of them are impressionists. And it's like, how do you get a concise foundation from people with wildly different expectations of what a finished painting is? Right? And so that's a starting point. The schools can only get as teachers what they can get. And every semester, every year, that's different. Depends which artists live in the area and are willing to teach, right? And so, you know, the schools, in a lot of ways, even even in the best of days, the education that they offer is a hodgepodge of ideas. It's not one person taking you from the start of the process to the finish of the process to develop a linear way of thinking about making art. Once you have that linear process and you understand how it works, you can then go and study with a hundred different artists and take just little pieces of what they do because you can see how what they're doing applies from your, you know, um, to, to painting from your already solid fundamentals, right? It puts, it gives you a vantage point. Those fundamentals, if they're taught in a linear way and you understand how they all interact, it gives you a vantage point to make sense of everybody else's approaches based on what you already understand. What happens is, you know, when you get into these, in, into colleges and, and these other kinds of programs, where the, where the process is kind of broken up and it's taught by a bunch of different people with a bunch of different ideas and they, their language, even if they're using the same words, isn't always the same. Words don't translate um, the same from one person to another. And even though the language sounds the same, they're describing different things. Or this, and 
The differences could be subtle and nuanced to the degree that you don't even know that they're not describing exactly the same thing. Even another pro might listen to them and think they know exactly what they mean because the words all make sense. But there's a margin of error in there. And like as a pro, when, when you misinterpret something, again, you, you, still, you still have your foundations in place, right? You're, you're, you're making a, you're, something is not communicated to you, but you, you already have those, those foundations in place. And so it doesn't, it doesn't rattle your ability to produce. You just don't understand how they get their result based on their language or you, you misinterpret it. But it doesn't change you as an artist. Um, and so like semester to semester, different teacher to different teacher, you, the, what you wind up getting is not always cohesive. And it's not, again, it's not the fault of the teachers necessarily. Um, some teachers, I'd argue, have no business teaching. Um, but, but even the ones who know what they're doing, they only have so much time. And in most cases, they're doing lowest common denominator teaching. They're struggling with the people who are, are spending their time with the people who can't get it, who, who are fighting to, to, to make some ground, where the people who have a, good, a decent grasp of it to start are basically set to just do their own thing. Again, classroom setting, colleges like that, very, very hard to get an education in this. And again, like, I mean, I, I go off on the schools, uh, but the entire system is a mess. The entire system has problems and that are not being addressed. And so generation after generation, people are paying for what they believe is an education, putting their trust and their money and their time, years of their life, into a structure that actually rarely delivers on the promise. And it's, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. And like I said, I mean, I really kind of, I kind of lean on the colleges, but the truth is they're part of the system. There is, there is hindered by the structure of how art is taught as, as anybody else. Um, mm. You know, there are, real, there are real limitations that they have. There's nothing they can do about it. Again, like I was saying this, like, if, you have an, if you're in art school, and this year, you don't get any good painting teachers. It's not like you can just can your painting program. You make do with what you have. And again, like so, so if you're a freshman and you come into a school and you get a bad painting teacher, you don't get all the things you need at the beginning. So in the second year, in the third year, in the fourth year, you're playing catch up the whole time, right? And so, and not all teachers are equal. Just like not all painters are equal. And so if you get a painting teacher who does a bad job of teaching, or even, even worse, which happens often enough, actually sets you on a path in the wrong direction, you may never recover from it. Because everything that you do is built on the thing you did before it, if it's a sound education. And so if those first few steps are not, are not moving you in the direction of where you need to go, they set you on a path that you may never be able to find your way back to where you need to be. And again, not always the fault of the teachers. Sometimes it is, but not always. And I don't think, I don't think that people go into teaching art with the intent of being, uh, of not helping. Like, I, I don't believe that to be the case. I believe that the people go into teaching art, go into it um, with, a, with an expectation that they're going to be able to help the next generation of artists um, develop skills necessary to produce art uh, in, at, a meeting, at a meaningful level. Um, but you know the intentions don't necessarily yield the result. But I do have I do have every advantage here. I have only my voice, nobody contradicting me. Um, you can work the program at your own pace. Um, so if you really want to knuckle down and blow through it, you could be through the entire program in a year, or you could spread it out over four years. You need whatever it is you want to do. Um, and I go from not just fundamentals, but I go from fundamentals all, to, all the way up to um, the kind of skills you would require to build an, an incredible career and not need any additional information. Experience is different. You would have to spend hours and hours and hours clocked in front of an easel 
but you wouldn't need to go anyplace else for additional information. And so there's a, there's a real advantage there. I have an advantage that very few people have from the standpoint of being an educator. And which is one of the reasons that we get these, like the results that we get are, are hard to believe. Because every place else you go, you don't see them. And what it is is that you've got this conversation semester to semester to semester with different voices pulling you one way or another. You know, a teacher tries to teach you something, they assume that you know A, B, and C, so they start with D. And if your hand doesn't go up and say, I have no idea what you're talking about, D e leads to E and F and G, and you don't get those either because you didn't understand the things that were necessary to understand those. And when you get to your third semester, now you're into F, you know, E, F, G, H, I, J, right? And there's, there's just no way to get back to those foundations. Here, it's all, like I said, it's all my language and it's all at your pace. You're not dragged along with somebody who picks it up faster and you're held back by somebody who's figuring it out slower. My attention is not on the slowest student in the room. Everybody gets to take the education at their own pace. And so, yeah, I have every advantage, every single advantage. But again, that goes back to what I was saying. The system for education for this is terribly flawed. A quarter, of a, a quarter of a million dollars to get an education that barely passes as an education in art. You'll never make a living at it. You'll never make a living at it. The odds are that you will wind up doing some menial job instead. Because the truth is that where a general education um, in liberal arts or communications or whatever, whatever major you can think of that nobody really regards as a serious education, it's the, it's the degree that you get just to go to college and say you've got a degree. Any person looking at hiring based on a degree will take that person over somebody with an art degree. An art degree is kind of laughable, right? And the art degree, if you took it seriously, it's not like you did any less work than the guy doing liberal arts. You might have done a lot more work, but it's, it's, it's disregarded. Um, and so, you know, they're not thinking about, about bringing you in for a management position based on your degree there, but they would think about it for liberal arts. So, you know, but the, the whole point is that the education system the way it is has real problems. And so when you go through it, you basically, you, you, you wind up owning those problems. You pay big, big dollars for it. You know, Evolve, Evolve was designed and the school here was designed so that people don't have to go down that road. I'm not, this is not the only way of doing it. Like I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't peddle that because that's nonsense. There are other ways of doing it. Um, but this, you found us, and this is a program that would offer you that single path, that, that one voice that allows you to get to where you're going at your own pace and covers all the bases. Nothing is left out. So. Question about the painting? Yes. From Mark Moody. Mm -hmm. A little confused here. Several times, Kevin has said, the background establishes the tones and hues of the subject, yet he still has large parts he hasn't added the second pass. In the background, almost the, in fact, the entire background has had a second pass. Everything in the background has a second pass. The jacket, the shirt, now the cuffs, the book. The only things that haven't had a second pass yet are his face, these two columns, which I, they're basically going to stay that color, right? So the face, the two columns, these metals over here, and the apron, the, and the collar I'm doing now. Those are the only things that haven't had a second pass. So I've already established many of these things well down the road from where they originally started. Sana said there was an interesting book about um, what you were talking about earlier uh, called Art and Fear by Bales and Orland. I'm not familiar with Art and Fear. Right, so here, like I'm finding I left out lines um, in my transfer. I'm just trying to make sense of some of these things as I go. And again, the big thing, I'm in no rush. I don't want to put something down that, that goes where it doesn't belong. 
and it potentially causes confusion later on. And I don't want to put something down in a place where it becomes a problem later on. I want to make sure that I'm not leaving any gold showing through on this edge. From Beverly Thatcher. So your program can sort of be thought of as an apprenticeship type system where everyone has the same base? Well, it's, it is an apprentice. Yeah, the, it's an education. It's an apprenticeship, basically. Um, but everybody moves at their own pace. And that's basically how it works. Um, and we have people who, you know, who do an assignment a week, and we have other people that are dropping off two assignments a day. Um, everybody is different. Depends on, on the demands of the life that you have, how serious you are about developing the skills and getting to your goals. But right? I think the people who are looking at career changes that they were, they were told earlier in life, and I get a lot of this, people who were told at one point in life that they couldn't make a living at this, and so they walked away from it, and they've, they've never really escaped the need to create. They've not escaped that desire inside of them. And when they come across our program, whether it's the brick and mortar school or the online program, and they see all of the success stories, people who sound just like them, I always wanted to be able to do this, but I didn't believe it was possible, or I went to art school and I didn't learn, I just didn't have the talent, like begin that word, talent. I, and, and like we had somebody, we had somebody in last week that was saying like, her art teacher told her to give up. Like who would do that? But it happens all the time. And what it is is, to me at least, is the teacher looks at the students and says, I don't know how to teach you. You're not getting what I'm showing you. You're not showing any of the things that, that you need to show to be, a, to be able to move this forward in, in a meaningful way to possibly have a career. So you're wasting your time. I'm doing you a favor and I'm kind of shutting that door for you right now, telling you go do something else. But I can tell you, like I said this very early on in this day, I got that same story. Like you, you're wasting your time and you're gonna do you a favor and tell you you can't make it. Go do something else. And had I listened to those voices, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I've spent my life, I've spent my entire adult life playing and being paid for it. I love what I do. I, it, I can't say that it's never felt like work, but like everybody I know for the most part, they get up every Monday, and they, they dread Monday, they get up every Monday, they go to work, they're out of the house from like eight o'clock in the morning till six in the evening, and they do that five days a week, and they buy their weekends. And basically Sunday, they enjoy the morning a little bit, but the impending Monday starts creeping into their mind around the afternoon. For me, I look forward to every day when I come into the studio, whether I'm teaching or painting. I, I have the, 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 the enviable position of loving what I do. I don't need vacations. I don't take vacations because vacations are no more fun to me than what I'm doing. And the idea that somebody would, would diminish like your belief in yourself to be able to attain that, that's crazy to me. And this program is about allowing people to reach that dream. And, and not necessarily for a career, but just for yourself. Like not everybody who comes into this program is interested in career. In the school, maybe only five Maybe 5% of my students are looking at careers, but they want to create. They want to be able to sit in front of an easel and produce something that matches their intent to be able to speak and create. So again, it's not even what other people think of it, but for them to be happy with what they make and to not struggle. This program gives you the flexibility to go anywhere from, from being a high-end hobbyist doing it purely for yourself and getting consistent results painting after painting after painting or to go all the way to a full-blown career there's no there are no boundaries in this you can do with it what you want if career is what you want everything that you need to be able to build a career is inside of the program it's all there I had a conversation with a couple of people um, online yesterday from the program um, about how you build a career I talked about it last week I put my brushes down for about 45 minutes and laid out how you go from making nothing to actually being able to pay your bills. I actually did it yesterday. Um, uh, Alicia Salt, if she's still around, she was in. And I showed how working on the weekends, you could pull in 80 grand a year. 
80 grand a year working weekends, nothing else. Now, it's not gonna start there. But the thing is, if you go to college, and you accrue all these debts and then you roll out into the world, first of all, you're paying off those bills, but you're not making 100 grand either. Even if the job that you're in is gonna grow into 100,000, it doesn't start there. You're starting at 50 or 60 and you expect to grow. As an artist, you don't wake up one day and decide you're gonna put your work out into the world and start making $40,000 a painting. You work your way there. Again, the, the way that people think about making a living at art is so skewed. Most art, like 70 plus percent of the art sold in the United States sells for under $5,000. And that means everything from like $100 up. So you don't have to think thousands of dollars for a piece of art. Right, if you enjoy the process and you don't mind standing in front of an easel and working a 40 hour week because it doesn't feel like work because you love what you're doing, you could easily, easily make a living making art as long as you have fundamental skills in place. It's not, it's not as hard as people think. And it's not as hard to find clients as people think. It's how you do it. And again, within the program, we talk about this stuff all the time, all the time. How do you build a career? It starts with the skills. You don't have the skills, you get nothing. There's no way to build a career without skills. However, once you have them, then it's a matter of laying the groundwork and, and, and walking the path. So, but the program is designed to offer you whatever you want out of your art, whether you're doing it simply for yourself or if you're gonna build something that's gonna pay your bills um, or build an empire for that matter. I'm just dusting this over the edge to make sure, like I'm using this to kind of break up that edge, um, to make sure that I don't have any of this gold creeping through. I don't want the gold in between the black of the tux and the purple. And again, if I find that I've left some behind accidentally, when I glaze the jacket in the next pass and push it to black, I'll be able to take it out. Uh, but I want to make sure that I'm not leaving it there because it'll read like an outline between the dark of the, the, the collar and the dark of the jacket. Mark Moody said, the Art Academy way is old school. What did the French call it? Begins with an A? Academy. I, I think he means Academy. atelier maybe? Atelier, yeah, mm -hmm. atelier. But, the, with, but with new methods. Uh, the French called it Academy and the Italians called it atelier. But yeah, I mean, basically, basically ateliers, you studied in the studio of an existing master. I'm not a master, <laughs> not even close, but I understand how it works. I'm skilled enough to make a living at it. I've made a living at it for 30 years. Um, and my experience, uh, because of how I learned it, because I had to figure it out from the ground up, my experience has made it easier for me to figure out how to explain it. Um, and, and like I said, like the term master is thrown around and that's great marketing. But the truth is, I'm just like everybody else. I stand in front of a painting. The only advantage I have over anybody watching or anybody that comes to my school is I've been doing it longer. That's it. There, there are no other advantages. Um, and the truth is, and I've said this before, my students, the ones that are serious, whether in Evolve or in the school, a lot of them, particularly the younger ones, will surpass me in my lifetime. Not in their lifetime, but in my lifetime. And the reason is, I spent, I spent almost two decades fumbling around figuring it out. All kinds of dumb ideas based on, based on just guesswork instead of having an education. Where the students that I train have a distilled education with no fractures or fissures. Their, their foundations are absolutely rock solid. There's no guesswork. All they need to do is follow the program and then clock the hours in front of the easel. And I've got students, again, even 17, 18 years old, that if you looked at their work, you'd be like, damn, like blown away. And we kind of walked the studio the other day. Not that their work is identical to mine in quality, but the thing is you would hang their work on your wall without even, without even thinking twice 
about where the art came from, that it was an 18 or 19 year old student, right? And you would only really see, like in my best students, the difference between their work and my work when you put their painting right next to mine. Because the stuff that separates mine from theirs is very, very subtle nuance. And only with a one-to-one -one comparison would you see it. And, and, you know, that's how it should be. Like, if you're being taught and, you know, you're, you're, you're a linear movement from knowing nothing to producing great art, and you're not zigzagging around and checking out things that have no value and incorporating them into your process until you realize that they're toxic, and then dumping them and trying to remember that's toxic, don't do it, because that's what I do. I've got a million things in my head, and you know, 23 of them are what I use to actually make good paintings, and I've got to sift through and find the 23 for every mark I make. People who have been trained properly don't have to do that. They've only got the 23 things, and they go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, and when they hit the 23rd, they go out the end and sign the painting. So for me, it's very reasonable for my most serious students to surpass me in my lifetime. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna have the pleasure of sitting back and seeing the work of my students that is better than what I can produce. And I look forward to it. I've already got a few students who I would argue are producing, not consistently, but are producing paintings that I would argue really come close, really come close to what I do. Meaning that within a couple of years, if they keep doing it, they will surpass me. We're talking about in their 20s. So by the time they hit their 30s, like early 30s, they will be equal to me at 50 plus with all of my experience. But that's what a distilled education offers. And I couldn't be more excited about it. Like some, some people might be bothered about the idea that their students would surpass them. I, I relish the idea. Um, I had a, a friend of mine, uh, another, another professional painter, he said to me one time, like, I need to like kind of dial back a little bit. I'm, I'm, creating, I'm creating an army of art monsters and they're just gonna spill out into the world. You know, when you're talking hundreds or thousands of artists coming out of a program like this every year or two, what does that do to the art market? Um, and he said like a lot of the pros, like I'm gonna be putting them out of work, including myself. Um, because like you think about it, a 23 or 25 or 28 or a 32 year old, you start, as you start getting older, it's different, but like you think in your 20s, somebody can produce a painting of the same size as mine that's not quite as good, but close enough and undercut my price, sell the painting for 20% of what I do and they're ecstatic with that paycheck where I couldn't pay my bills with it because I have different responsibilities, I have a different lifestyle based on what I'm accustomed to earning. So they can actually undercut my price. And so by, by building this army of people who can produce work at that quality, yes, I do run the risk of making myself as an artist obsolete. But my response to that was, if that's the case, if I can produce that many successful artists that could actually put me and you and all these other guys that I know out of work, then I think I have a career as a teacher. And so I'm okay with that. I don't have a problem with that. It's a good trade-off. But again, you know, one of the things is, the more artists there are, and the better their work is, the more I am forced as an artist myself to improve every day. If I don't have competition, it's easy to get lazy. It's easy to accept what I did yesterday as being good enough for today. And so having the competition forces me to stay on my game. It forces me to do the best I can do every single day, every painting I deliver. Easy to get lazy when there's no competition. And so, it's in that, it's another good thing. Students being, being educated and producing incredible work forces me, forces my, my peers to be on their game every day or, be, or risk becoming obsolete. That's a good thing. It keeps art, it keeps art growing. Question. Yes. But you work all the time. Aren't you also continuing to improve? Yes, but the growth is, is, growth is clear and obvious at the beginning. When you go from nothing to something, that's a massive jump. 
the next something is gonna be a big jump too. The jumps get smaller and smaller as you progress. At a point where you clear the bar of producing arguably prof consistent professional level work, the growth on the other side of that, though still significant, is gonna be in tiny little increments. And at some point you get far enough above that bar where your growth is only gonna be recognizable by somebody who already knows more than you. Anybody who doesn't already know that stuff won't even know what you're doing differently. Because again, the, the, the nuance, it's so subtle. You know it. And somebody who really knows what they're looking at will recognize it. But you might have to make 10 or 15 or 20 of those little advances for somebody to recognize it in your work. And it's, it's so nuanced. But really, what makes, what makes the greatest art so beautiful is the nuance. Um, and you spend a lifetime, a, actually the rest of your life, once you clear that bar as a pro, and again, not being a professional, but producing at that level, you then spend the rest of your life, not a few years, but the rest of your life, developing that nuance. It's a journey you spend every time you step in front of a canvas, you develop it a little further. And um, the, the journey is the, is the thing. Like, you love spending, and spending your time and, and growing here. You get excited. Something that nobody else sees that I, real, I just realized something, I get excited about it. No different than when we have this person in the program and they finish a block and they're going from grayscale into color. They get so excited. I figure out something that nobody can see but me, I get just as excited. Because the breakthroughs are, they're, they're so subtle now and there's more and more time between them. And so when I find something that I didn't see before, I, uh, I get excited. <clears throat> Question from Jeff Harrington. Yes. Never been able to paint a person. Do you teach how to do that in the program? So this is actually something we, I've not talked about um, yet. And it's actually a fundamental principle of Evolve uh, and how I think as a teacher. There's no such thing as painting a person. I know there are classes on painting portraits, but there's no such thing as painting a person. You don't paint landscapes. You don't paint still lifes. You paint. If you know how to paint a ball, a landscape, a still life, or even a portrait are the same thing, right? So the problem with the idea that, paint, that you're painting a portrait is that a portrait is extraordinarily complex. Um, and we make it more complex by how we think about it, right? <clears throat> if I gave you a ball to paint, you'd sit down and you'd paint the ball. No fear, no pressure. I give you a portrait to paint, hmm, now there's pressure. You've gotta make it look like the person. Hey, you didn't worry about making the ball look like the ball. So wh why the added pressure? <clears throat> so I wanna show you what the pressure does to you and why you don't want to paint a portrait, but you want to learn to paint and then simply apply the paint to a different subject. <clears throat> um, in gymnastics, the balance beam is six inches wide. And when, when you're first learning how to do things on a balance beam, they put the balance beam on the floor. And the reason they do that is there's no fear of failure, right? If you fall, you're only, you're only eight inches away from the ground. And <clears throat> pretty much, 100% of the population of the world could get on that balance beam and walk from one end to the other. And not even doing this, just kind of walk it. You take that same exact balance beam, six inches wide, and put it four feet off the ground where they do it, where they use it for actual gymnastics. You wipe out like 95% of the people of the population of the world even being able to walk across it without this kind of stuff going on. But what's changed? Nothing. The beam is still six inches wide. The difference is what you think about it. You've elevated what the risk of failure is, what the potential for failure, right? Not just the falling the four feet, but it feels different to you. You're no longer just walking across a six inch beam. You're walking across a six inch beam that is four feet off the ground. That added four feet changes how you think and paralyzes you, makes you question what you're doing. So now you take that same balance beam. An Olympic gymnast can be blindfolded and 
flip and jump and land across that thing over and over and over and over again, right? They do it in practice over and over and over and they're perfect. When they go to the Olympics, you see them fall off the beam all the time. How does that happen? They've practiced this thing, they've done it a thousand times and they never have a problem. Well, the added pressure of, comp of competition rattles them. It's still the same six inch beam. Now, take that same balance beam. You put it 100 feet in the air, even tethered to it, you'd be hard pressed to find an Olympic gymnast that could even crawl across it. I'm not talking walk, I'm talking crawl. Hugging it for their dear life, you'd probably not be able to find one Olympic gymnast that could even get across it if it were 100 feet in the air. It's still the same six inch beam that they can dance across with a blindfold in practice. What's changed? It's how they think about what they're doing. So, if they can do all this crazy stuff on the ground with it, if they didn't know it was 100 feet in the air, if they didn't complicate it with all of their ideas and just remember that it was a balance beam and it was the same, they should be able to dance across it at 100 feet too. When we paint a portrait, we're taking the balance beam off the ground and putting it 100 feet in the air and then wondering why we can't make sense of what we're doing. When I say there is only painting, what I mean is a ball, a still life, anything, a painting outdoors, a portrait, are made up of the same components. You have shadows and you have lights. You have color, right? So you have shadows and lights which are value. You have color and you have edges. There's nothing else. Doesn't matter if it's a ball or a landscape or a portrait. The components that come together to make the painting, regardless of the subject or its complexity, are always the same. Values, colors, edges. They never change and there's never, there's never more. If you get command of values and colors and edges, the subject that you're painting becomes irrelevant because the ball is filtered through value, color, edge. The landscape is filtered through value, color, edge. You're not looking at a landscape, you're looking at values and colors and edges. When you do the portrait, it's not a portrait. It's a value, color, edge decision over and over and over, and the portrait emerges from those decisions. It keeps the balance, if you, if you paint based on an understanding of those three fundamentals, the balance beam always stays on the ground. It never gets put up in the air, and so, we never paint portraits. We never paint still lifes. We, ne we only paint. We utilize the components and we apply them equally regardless of the subject or its complexity. And that's, that, is a, that is a major defining thing in being able to elevate your skill set very quickly. If you think of a portrait, another thing is this. If you paint a portrait of Bob Smith, you've never painted Bob Smith before, you are a novice when you paint Bob Smith because you've never done it before. You have zero experience with Bob Smith. After you finish painting Bob Smith, you then, pan, you then paint Mary Johnson. Mary Johnson, you've never painted her before. You are a novice going into her painting because you've never painted her before. But if everything you paint is based on value, color, and edge, and you don't think of the painting any other way, when you paint Bob Smith, if you've done a hundred other paintings of, it doesn't matter what the subject matter is, it could be portraits and landscapes and, and still lifes, and every single painting was built up based on those three moving parts, Bob Smith is just the next one in a string of the same technique that you are developing mastery in. You're not a novice, because the hundred paintings you've done have shown you how best to utilize those three components. And then when you paint, um, Mary Johnson after that, she's just more of the same. It doesn't matter that her face is a different shape and that her skin tones are a different color and the lighting is different because shadows are shadows. Lights are lights. Colors are colors. It doesn't matter what they're attached to. And so separating yourself from the subject and having a process that equalizes all subjects in their complexity is key to being successful, at least from where I stand. I hope that answers your question. But that's a very important thing in learning how to make art.
I'd also say that if you have a process that you apply to making paintings and it doesn't work for every single painting, it's not a process, right? It might feel like one, but if you don't have a way of filtering the information, breaking it down, and, and that, it, that it, the technique, the process works equally for every subject, no matter how simple or complex, it's really not a process. If it has to be, if it has to be juggled to fit one thing or another differently, um, then it's, it's, at least in that, it's flawed. Again, just like making sure that I'm wiping out as much of that gold that might be sitting in between as I can, taking that edge down. I don't mind a little purple creeping into the collar of the tuxedo, but I want to make sure that I'm not leaving any gold creeping through if I can help it. Um, there is some gold showing through the collar itself, but I don't want to leave the impression of an outline. That I definitely want to avoid.
make sense of some of these things that are going on here. Um, some of it not as obvious as other things. Mark Moody says, thank you, Kevin and Daniel, so much. Over the past couple of weeks, I've taken pages of notes. I've been using many of your concepts, your process in my impressionist landscapes. Well, I'm, I'm glad that it's been of some value to you. The whole reason for doing this is to be able to share. Um, you know, even though I keep talking about the Evolve program, um, just putting it out there so people are aware that it exists. Right, because there are some people that want to learn and don't know where to go. There's a lot of information out there and it's hard to figure out. But, but really doing this, and especially doing it the way I'm doing it, I'm playing all kinds of games with this, painting it differently than I would necessarily paint it if it were a commission piece, and doing a lot of talking and explaining what's going on here. Because I want people who are watching to be able to walk away with some information they can use. right? Even if. You know, I don't expect most of you to be interested in the program that we offer, but I would like to be able to offer some information to help make the path easier for you, and this painting gives me the opportunity to do that. So I'm glad that you're getting, I'm glad that you're getting actionable information out of this, getting some ideas to kind of expand those horizons. Again, I'm trying to make sense of what's going on in here, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit all over the place. Um, like everything is kind of turning into these strange ellipses, and the transfer that I have here is not lining up properly. Something's not making sense, and so. Um, and again, I'm just taking my time, and again, I, like I'm pointing this out to you because a lot of the time. Somebody, somebody who is not worried about the end result so much would just push through it and be done with it. I can't do that. And if you want to produce high level, consistent quality work, this is it. Like you've, you've got to figure this out before you move on. There's no moving on to the next thing until this is resolved. It has to be resolved in a meaningful way so that, the, uh, that I, don't, I don't make a mess here and then kind of Gonna make it even more difficult to figure out where stuff goes later on. I said this one appears to be about right. You know, and again, I just have to look at it long enough, and it will, it'll start to make sense to me. And I'm looking for landmarks. I'm looking at this tie and the line that comes across here, and where it hits, and where it relates, right? So, like I'm trying to figure out this piece. It's not lining up. So I'm looking at this curve, 
and seeing what it lines up with. I'm trying to figure out this clasp. When I'm looking at that kind of stuff, even these little ripples that I put in the outer edges, again, anything that will give me a clue as to where another landmark might be that'll tell me, again, one landmark might be all I need to then just open up the floodgate and then push through. Uh, but at the moment, I've not, I've not got the information that I need. And so, which is fine. I mean, I'll figure it out as I go, um, taking time. And if I find that this is not working for me and it starts to frustrate me, I'll just come down here and I'll do this and I'll work my way up. And eventually, there'll just be this little area and it'll be all that's left and it won't it really won't be a big deal. Right now, while all of this is waiting for me to finish this, it feels a little, it's a little annoying. But if I then pull in from here and come up, maybe this will give me what I need here as I get these other ones in place, maybe not. But I've spent enough time trying to figure it out. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna move back down to the bottom here. And I'm gonna work my way up and see if I can make sense of it as I get up here. I imagine that I imagine that as I come up here and I'm explaining these, this space is going to become cordoned off and I'm going to be able to say, oh, I see exactly what's going on here, and I'll be able to just lay it in. Question. Yes. Is your hand touching the jacket while you paint, or did yeah. you allow it to dry before going on? Um, the, the jacket is dry. The jacket was painted um, last week, or the, yeah, it was painted last week, I think. And since then, the painting's even been sealed. There's an isolating layer down that um, basically locks the, the paint that's underneath in place. So yeah, it's completely dry and I don't even have to worry about scuffing it or scratching it as I'm working. It's pretty well protected. Beverly Thatcher says, I've been actively searching for several years. I'm glad I found you and your program. Thank you. Well, nice to have you here. And we're glad that you found us too. Yeah. We have about 30 minutes before Facebook Live will take us off.
I mean, like this stuff, once I start moving in this direction, like these are very clear, I'll probably be able to squeeze this up and make sense of it. And like when I get back up here, it'll probably fall right into place for me. And again, I mean, I talked about this at one point earlier on. It's like a Sudoku puzzle. Um, Sudoku? Sudoku, Sudoku, whatever it is. Um, basically, I don't, I try to get the ones that are easy first. I try to make sense. Like I was working from here down, but when I ran out of things to do over here, because they're difficult, I can't figure them out, I can tackle it from this direction. Maybe when I get back here, this will be obvious. Um, and so, like no reason to struggle and be stuck. I just move on. Now, obviously, eventually I have to go back and resolve that stuff, but with everything else around it in place, it might be easy to figure out exactly what I couldn't see before. a wall up there and again I get I take a couple of minutes to try to make sense of it but rather than beat myself up over it it's easier to just move on and come at it from another direction Mark Moody, just to answer your question, um, in the video here, everything is sharp and in focus, and the blurriness that you do see is through networking issues. this edge that I'm leaving no gold peeking through in between. Some gold will shove through the purple here, but I don't want uh, the impression of a line. I don't want it to feel outlined.
going to move the camera over your shoulder. I accidentally picked up a little bit too much paint, and I'm going to wipe with this terribly thick lid shift, so I kind of getting the paint off my brush down here, rather than going back and wiping it off the brush. I just put it down here, and then I'll kind of use this as my palette as I move up. I don't want to do that, but it doesn't make sense to go back and get the paint off the brush. Um, it's easier to just utilize it from there. edges now before I work my way up. I'm already seeing problems in here as well. So I'm going to take down this edge. And again, I'm just looking to make it feel less sharp. I'm not worried about it being perfectly smooth, just less sharp. It will feel a little bit blurred. What number brush are you using for this detail? I'm using a number six brush. So it's not very small. It's a number six filter. I don't think anybody would call this a detail brush. Well, I would. But most people would not call this a detail brush. It's, um, But it, I don't need a very small brush for what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting in like a dot of a highlight in an eye. I'm just taking an edge down. So. A bigger brush is actually better for something like this. Um, small brushes leave small marks. I'm not looking for small marks. I'm looking to kind of spread this stuff out. And so a bigger brush is just gonna, it's gonna do a better job of it. You know, we, we tend to think that when we get into tighter spaces and we're trying to make more control, you know, a mark that's more control, that a smaller brush is necessarily what we need. But not always. Often enough, a bigger brush, um, the clumsier nature of a bigger brush gives us a gives us a softer edge and a more organic look, which might, which in some cases is exactly what we're looking for. Like this edge is not refined, but it feels soft. And from three feet away, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. And if you get up close, you can see some of the inner workings, the brush strokes that are there, which is fine. Um, I don't need to eliminate all of them for what I'm doing. Um, some of those little squiggly areas look pretty cool. So again, this is one of those times that I would love to have an actual size image. This would be a breeze with an actual size image. The problem that I'm running into is that I'm having to try to scale things up. There aren't a lot of landmarks in here to figure out what things are. And these, all of these, they're turned on their sides. So they're not, there's really not much going on here. 
to make sense of. One of the one of the good things though is that because I can't make heads or tails of most of it, when I paint it, it doesn't have to be much more than abstract um, shades and color choices, right? I don't have to render details. So like in some of these, these I need to render specific things. The, the symbols that are on here are particular. But in here, as long as they feel like flattened coins, that's all that they need to be. So I'm not going to invent anything and try to make it look like more than it is. These are like from here to here, they're all just abstract marks and they can be laid in in a very impressionistic way once I've cordoned them off and made the shapes right. So once I've got the purple in place, it'll be easy to knock them out when I come back around to them later on. Right now, the thing is just getting the purple in place. So this is a little bigger, um, a little closer to the scale, so maybe this will be a little easier to work with. Again, one to one, I could literally just slip it in here and I could see exactly what the heights are. Each one of these will be a challenge to make sure that um, the shape is right, the, the, the width of it is right, so that they link up when I get up in here and hopefully tell me where this is. Mark Moody is asking if it's permitted, could Daniel post the picture on the website? To yeah. me, the gold lo necklace looks like it is setting sitting on the black jacket and there's no purple yeah um do we have do you have a picture i don't um what we'll do is like we're not going to do it now but um i've got the photograph and we'll post it tomorrow before we start so you can check it out then but um it's there it's there it's barely discernible but it's there um there's not much like back in here i can't see anything but here i see purple kind of disappears and then it lifts back up again um, it's very close. It's about the same value as a tuxedo. It's just a color shift. And so any place where it rolls into a shadow it just disappears into the tux. But rest assured, it is there. I'm not inventing it. Um, the photograph is probably giving me more information than what you're seeing. Um, so, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm not inventing any of this. I don't want, I definitely don't want to do that. Nicholas said that his number six brush has ponytails now. Ponytails. And Laurel is asking, were the necklace details put in on the transfer? Some, some. There were little scribbles and not much. They're not, it's not highly detailed. I mean, it would take forever to, to do a transfer in detail. One of the other issues that I'm running into is when I put the jacket in, I blended the edge into this a little bit, so I can't even use that as a landmark. Um, 
I'm missing some of the information that would have been in the original uh, transfer. I'm having to figure it out based on edges that have migrated, that are not where they belong. And so that's part of it. Like, it can throw you off, right? You see an edge and you're like, so I have this little in and out over here and I can see it. And in the photograph, that denotes where something is going on. But as I blended the paint, it moved. And so now it doesn't line up properly with what's here. So I can't use it as a landmark anymore. And again, this is one of the reasons why you have to be able to work from direct observation, right? My ability to make sense of these things comes from, from looking at things and drawing them from scratch. The transfer sometimes causes more confusion than anything else. And so you have to be able to get past what the transfer is telling you to see what's really going on sometimes. So I'm like, I've got all kinds of a mess up in here. I'm, I'm actually seeing that this is not correct. And that's why this isn't uh, making sense. This is here. So this is a shadow that I've left out. I left it as a vacant shadow. That's actually what's causing the problem. So I just made sense of it um, just now. Right, and actually I'll tell you how I figured it out. This um, crease in the, in the lapel lined up with the, with the links. So this lined up with, with this intersection. That's actually what, what was the key to me figuring it out. So you see, like, I wasn't looking down in here, I was trying to use, utilize everything up in here, but this wasn't right. And so it was throwing me off, it wasn't making any sense. Now that I've taken it from another side, I kind of pushed up from here and it's still not lining up. So now I use this and it told me exactly what was wrong. And so now that I've got that, this should all kind of fall into place nicely. Question about uh, brushes? Yes. From Nicholas, is there anything you can do when your brush has pigtails to reshape it? Or should I just trim those hairs off, or should I just get another brush? Well, if you can trim them away and the brush is still good, then do that. You gotta be gentle with your brushes when you're using them and when you're cleaning them. Also, when you clean them after you're done, flatten them back into the position that you want them to be in when you work the next day. Um, don't just leave them. Don't just leave them splayed out. Um, you can also put. Um, you can use conditioner on them, like you would use for your hair. Um, that's not going to hurt either. I mean, these are synthetic, but I imagine that probably helps anyway. Um, any, or, I mean, like treat them like their hair. But the, the trick is that when you're painting, don't beat them up. Don't bear into the brush. Drag the brush as much as you can, side to side, gently. Don't, don't, don't mangle the brush when you work. Like if you see when I'm working, I'm not pressing hard. I'm using just the tip of the brush. The brush barely bends under my hand. And so these brushes, they'll stay in this condition, this pristine condition. I mean, for many, many paintings, because I'm being gentle with them. So I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna wipe out the mistake that I built in. And again, I may wind up having to overpaint some of this to fix it. And that I, if I have to do that, then it'll get done tomorrow. Again, it'll get done before I do the face. Um, and definitely, even if I don't do it tomorrow, definitely before I go in and start my glazing. Um, so again, I just need to figure out exactly where this thing went off track. I know in here, this shadow is what's missing. I left that out, I left it vacant. And so, that's actually the edge, and I don't know why I ran the collar down. It doesn't belong there. So what I put in when I first did the collar, not the purple, but the tuxedo collar, I drew this line down and it doesn't belong there. That was, that was a mistake. So I'm gonna have to over, I'm gonna have to over paint that um, to fix it. Now I'm looking to just make sure that everything else is in place so that I can just kind of cover that uh, before I move on. 
All right, so this is here. Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm pretty good in here. I don't want to have to, like, I don't want to bounce back and forth. I want to be able to go in there and clean up this section, surgically fix it. I have to match colors and match values and, and overwrite some of the things that are not correct. And then um, it'll be fine. So I'm not gonna be able to resolve it completely today, but I wanna make sure the purple I'm putting down goes where it belongs. Um, Question from Rebecca. Yes. If you teach 100,000 people how to paint like you, how many do you think will go professional? So this is what I would say. I, I, I'm assuming that I, that I understand what the intent of the question is. I would say that if 100,000 people came and studied with me and 100,000 people put in 100% effort and did what they were told and didn't cheat themselves, 100,000 professionals would walk out of the program. I believe that. Um, where people fall short is in their focus. You know, it's like a diet. People want to diet, they want to lose weight. It's important to them. And they get on the diet and the diet's tough because they're accustomed to eating things and now they're not allowed. And they, 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 they feel that, right? It's not, it's not just like they like the taste of something, but there's chemical stuff that's involved in your brain every time you eat something like sugar and cake and uh, whatever it is. <clears throat> and so as, as they get into the diet, they've got to be committed to it, right? And you can, you can diet for three months Say you want to drop, let's say you want to drop um, 50 pounds and you get X number of months in and you're 30 pounds down. It's so easy to then go like, well, I've been really great and I'm going to reward myself for what I've just done. And you eat something you're not supposed to. And that leads to another treat and another one and another one and another one. And eventually you give back everything that you got. And what it is is that you lost focus you lost the goal. You, you felt good enough about where you were that you started to cut corners on just how tight you had to be in order to get where you wanted to be. This is not, I'm, I'm actually gonna take this from, from actually somebody in our program. Um, this is not a destination. So like the problem that people have when they diet is they think it's a destination. You go on a diet, and you want to lose 50 pounds, and you lose 50 pounds, and then you go back to what you were doing, and you put it all back on. It's not a destination. It's a road travel for your life. If you want to make art, it's a commitment. Every day you get up and you work. Now again, it's not like going to work and, like, and, and um, crunching numbers if you're an accountant. The work doesn't feel like work if you love it. So you dwell in the process. It's the process, it's the everyday in front of the canvas. And if you love that, it's easy to commit the time every day. It's not like I want to become a pro and then I'm gonna stop growing and stop making paintings. Once I get that one perfect painting, I'm done. You're always looking for more, you're always looking to develop more. And if that's who you are, if that's what you want, and you come into the program, that's exactly what you get on the other side. You get all of the skills and your result is gonna be based almost entirely on how serious you were while you were doing the work. You know, I talk about this with students all the time. A painting doesn't die from a catastrophic injury. It's always, I know we're coming up on our deadline. Um, you know, why don't we do we this? We have about uh, seven minutes. Okay, so we got about seven minutes. I'm gonna keep this tight. Pieces of art, paintings, don't die from catastrophic injuries. It's never one bad thing that ruins a painting. It's a thousand little decisions where you said, mm, that green's green enough. That sharp edge, nah, it's sharp enough. It's not, but it's good enough. And you take 100%, what you know is 100% of your ability, not perfection. So we talk about perfection and excellence. Perfection is never attained. Excellence can be attained in every single stroke. And excellence, the difference is, excellence is 100% of what you can deliver. Not 93%. But if you know better than what you are delivering, that you fix it. And that distinguishes the amateurs from the pros. 
If you get into a piece of art and you are committed that every mark will be the best mark you can generate, you will produce professional level work once your knowledge catches up with your drive. And it's that simple. I produced, I produced almost 300 professional illustrations with almost no skills, no understanding through sheer force of will. Every single mark was what I intended it to be within, the abil within my abilities. And even if a mark took me 15 minutes to mix one dot worth of color, the color was the right color when it went onto the canvas. Now, I don't recommend going that road. That's a lot of work based on no knowledge. But if you have the knowledge and you put that kind of focus and care into your work, and it's not hard, it's a decision. You have to make the decision that it's not about getting the painting done, but about being in the process and making each step work. A painting is an equation. It's a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand decisions that you make. What color, what value, and when you mix it, do you take the time to test it against your photograph to make sure it's right? Do you then put it in the painting and make sure it goes into the right space. And then when you mix the next color, do you just do the same thing? Do you take the extra moments of care to make sure that the decisions you're making, that they're not just decisions based on what you see, but that you've checked them every possible way you could before putting them into the painting? And then even when they're in the painting, do you check them again? Do you have everything that you have, you bring to bear to make sure you've put nothing into the painting that was not intentional and that your intention is to be as good as you can with each mark, right? So all of these decisions, these hundreds of thousands of decisions, equal the painting. The painting is the result of the choices you make, the colors, the values, the cut corners or the not cutting corners. So the painting is never just a painting. It's the, um, the cumulative effect of the positives and the negatives that you put into the painting with each stroke. So the painting, Okay, we're back. Um, we got dropped. Uh, Facebook dropped us. So um, we're back. Um, again, just to finish up that last thought, <clears throat> you know, I was asked again, a thousand pe uh, 100,000 people enter the program, how many would walk out as pros? If everybody gives 100% maximum effort, every single one of them could. There's absolutely nothing holding them back. You know, and so, um, and I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that. Um, it all comes down to how much you commit. And, um, you know, and again, you don't have to be the best artist in the world to make a living at it. You just need to be consistent at a certain level. Again, you know, not everybody has to be Michelangelo, right? Because in Michelangelo's time, there were hundreds and hundreds of other master artists walking around. Don't have to be Michelangelo. Most of them you've never even heard of. You have to go. You have to go to Italy to find them. Italy and France. You go into the Louvre, you get an understanding of it. <clears throat> you know, you walk through a room um, that has, say, a window of like, say, forty years of, um, of art, and it has, you know, two hundred and eighty painters, and you've only heard of three of them, right? The others were all doing just fine in their time. <clears throat> you just don't. You just don't hear about them. Lots of artists out there making a good living at it that you don't hear about. Look, how many of you even, like, like how many of you even knew who I was when you came across this? Probably a very, very small number. And I'm very hard to find on the internet. Um, all of my illustration career was done before the internet. That hurts to say. Um, so you're not gonna see my work out on the internet like that. <clears throat> and my portrait work is private. They're private commissions. So I'm not, in, I'm not involved with portrait brokers or anything like that. I do, I do all of my work myself. I find my clients, I cultivate relationships. I do it all myself. So it's not like, um, you know, Portrait Society of America is gonna have my stuff. I'm not involved in groups. I just get up every day and I do my work. Doesn't, it hasn't diminished my career at all, um, but I'm, I'm hard to find. Now with Evolve, you'll see a lot, if you look me up, you find me in a lot of places, but it's mostly connected to Evolve. Um, but I'm quietly doing my thing and I'm very well established. So, so like, 
redefining what you think of as a pro, I think, is part of it, right? A pro is somebody who makes a living at it. It's not a matter. It's not about fame. It's about making a living at it, doing what you love. <clears throat> and so, if you're thinking fame, like how many artists out of a hundred thousand will be famous? That's a very different number. But there's a you have to have a particular personality for that. That has nothing to do with your art skills. But to make a living, everybody could make a living if they if they put in the energy. And again, we we frame the program to make that possible. We even talk about the business end of it because that's. The business end of it is as important as your skills. You can't do anything if you don't have the skill. But once you have the skill and you can deliver consistently, then it's a matter of what your plan, how you get your work out into the world to sell it. Yeah, question? Yeah, Rebecca was, uh, said, makes me wonder how many people just want this as a hobby. A lot of people. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. What an incredible hobby. Um, and again, like you think about what's a hobby. Well, what is a hobbyist? Like doing it as a hobby, you're not forced to deliver anything, right? You do it purely for the love, right? And actually, like Mitch and I were talking about this yesterday. Like you think about like you have a dabbler, somebody who just plays around. Like they, there's no standard, there's no goal, there's just playing with material. And they can produce beautiful, beautiful work. Um, but but they're not, they're, there's no driving force to be better. They're just... They're enjoying themselves. And some of those people get a sense that they can do more. And they grow, they kind of cross this bridge by watching videos like, like maybe stuff on YouTube or buying a few books. But they're generally, what they're taking on is not an education. They're looking for pieces of information to make what they're already doing better, make it easier. And they become the hobbyists. And the hobbyists they still don't have a bar that they have to reach because the work is still being produced only for their personal enjoyment, right? And so it's not until you start looking at becoming a pro that you wind up with a, a need for a consistent quality. And it has to be an elevated quality. It can't just be like, well, you know, I'm consistently bad, consistently mediocre. It has to be consistently good to start moving in the direction of being a pro. Now, you can produce professional level work, meaning consistently at a high level, and still be a hobbyist. Because you don't want to deliver work to somebody on a schedule, you just want to create for you, for the love of it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, people who do it for a living, you know, th that's completely fine, but people who do it as a hobby, it's the same thing, only one person is trying to get out of doing other stuff to make a living, right? You don't want to be an accountant anymore, you want to make art. And if you can trade off one for one dollar and do it as an artist, why wouldn't you if you could, right? And then you have other people who are happy with what they do for a living and they don't want the pressure of having to deliver art. They worry about it taking the fun out of it. But that doesn't mean they don't want to be exceptional at what they do. And so a program like Evolve is for that. It's for the people who want to be hobbyists that are, but they want the elevated product. They want to be able to produce exactly what they want to be able to produce. They want to be able to explain visually what they intend. The pros want to do the same thing, but they're willing to do it under the constraints of a delivery date and a subject matter that someone else chooses so that it pays their bills so they don't have to do other things to pay their bills. And that's really the distinction, right? And Evolve is basically saying, we can, we can, if you put in the energy, we can show you how to create that consistently high-level work that will allow you either one of those options. So, hobby is fine. Jeremy Woods just announced he landed the biggest portrait job ever. I had no idea how to price it at 50 inch by 70 inches, and I'm doing it for 7,000 and bid it for 60 days. He said he's pretty stoked. What's the size? 50 inches by 70 inches. Oh, that's a big painting. One figure? Multiple figures? We'll find out. You said you landed it off of Instagram. Wow. Good for you. Good for you. I, I would love to see what you do. I'd love to see one of your portraits if you could post it there. Is Unfortunately, there a, you can't, pay, you okay. can't post photographs, but you could post a link if you have a website, Jeremy. Jeremy, actually, you know what? Um, I'm trying to think, how can, he, how can he get it to me? I'm actually just curious to see what you do. Um, actually, you know what? Get a link out here for us if you can. 
Um, if not, we'll figure out a way. I'd love to post it because everybody watching, one of the big things that we run into is, well, you can't make a living at this. You just pulled down, what did you say, $6,200? $7,000. $7, a $7,000 portrait commission off Instagram. Good for you, good for you. And again, I would love to see what you're producing that would, that would generate that sale on Instagram. Because that's, that's spectacular. That's spectacular. I'm excited for you. One figure. One, wow. That's a, that's a, that's a substantial painting for one figure. Um, very nice, very nice. And that's a good paycheck. It's a good paycheck. Yeah, well, let's see if, if you can send a link. I would love to see what it is. Um, I'd love to see it now so I can just talk about it a little bit. Uh, you know, just any portrait that you have. I'm just curious about the, the, the quality of what you're producing. So also, um, Jeremy, if you, I, you said it's the biggest thing you've ever done, if it is by far the biggest thing you've ever done, meaning like two or three times the size of the biggest thing you've ever done, if you need any help kind of getting it off the ground, figuring it out, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can reach me through Evolve, just reach out to customer service from Evolve, um, or reach out to me and I will get back to you um, and we can talk. But I'd be happy to, if you need any advice or any, again, I don't know where you are. You could be a completely solid painter and not need any ideas from me. Or, again, being that being it's a very large piece, if you have any questions, I would be happy to offer any input along the way for you. You got some of the stuff? Yeah. You can scroll through these and click on them. Good for you, good for you. You've got some really nice stuff here. Um, like I said, if I can be of any assistance, don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can reach me through Evolve, or you can reach me through um, Kevin at theartacademy.us. You go to the Art Academy website, my email is there. Reach me either place, I would be happy to, to, to give you some, some time if you need it. And again, I, I don't wanna overstep, but if I can be of service, please feel free to reach out to me. That's so exciting. Yeah. And it's funny because I don't perceive Instagram as a place to sell portraits, but clearly I'm mistaken. <clears throat> I guess any place that you're any place that you're putting something that's good, um, you you run the risk of running into somebody who wants to own it. That's great though, very nice. <clears throat> but so I think I'm done with the collar. I'm just gonna knock it down. I got a couple of edges I need to soften a little bit. He said he just went public a year ago. Very nice, good. Very, very exciting. And I'm sure that I'm sure that it will generate additional interest. They'll show it to their friends. It's gonna it's gonna hopefully it opens additional doors for you. And that's really great. Very excited for you. Jeremy said, thanks. I'll keep that in mind. I've been painting about three years. And thanks, that is great you are, that, that is great that you were there. Promote, promote, promote. A close mouth doesn't get fed right. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, as long as you have the skills to deliver, then it's just a matter of getting your work out in front of the right people with the right language, right? And, 
and you know you you figure it out as you go in a lot of cases you know obviously no no one size fits every scenario so you figure out what is what you know what are your strengths when you speak like how do you because not everybody is necessarily a great orator um, some people are uncomfortable so how do you get around that right you don't want to you don't want to sell what you do in a way where you diminish what you do right if you're if you're uh, uncomfortable around people maybe being out in public and selling is not the way to go but there's another means to do it right and so you want to find the way that best fits who you are um, and utilize that as your way of selling So this collar is basically in. Um, uh, Belinda Jackson, she's she's new. She just uh, jumped onto this live video. She's asking, how big is that painting you're doing? This painting is well, it's life size, um, but it is a three quarter life size. It is thirty five inches wide by fifty three tall. Everything that I do, the scale, the size of the painting always changes, but I only work in life size. All right, so here's just a little thing. I left this out accidentally the other day, so I want to get this in. Again, I'm just trying to close the door on everything that, that needs to be done before that third pass starts. sure I've left that I've, everything is just it's ready um, so that when I get into the third stage if I miss something and I do the third stage I get it started I will then have to go in and surgically fix and that's a lot of work you have to go down these tiny little brushes and really kind of refine an area and I want to try to avoid that if I can So if I come across something that is not done, or is not done right, and that happens, um, I will clean it up. Clean it up when I find it. Try not to leave it, try not to leave it for later, if I can help it. And again, I'm not dropping what I'm doing. Like I just, I knew I was gonna come around, take care of this, get it in with the, you know, so the, because it's part of the jacket. Um, I knew I would do it before I moved on from the collar. barely even visible in there. It looks just like the collar. But now that's in place, one less thing to worry about going forward. So now I'm gonna come down, I'm gonna knock out some of the purple down in here, get it out of the way. And then I think I'm done for the day. Just take a look at this tape here. What's the plan for tomorrow? Um, I've got a lot of knickknacks to clean up. So I've got a lot of things to kind of clean up and play with as I'm staging this for the third pass. And there's still second pass stuff that has to be done. But I'm going to play around probably with the metals tomorrow. I'll probably do some work in here. Again, I'm going to try to try to pull this a little bit closer, nudge a few things closer to the finish line. So on Wednesday, I do the face. And I'm, I sh hopefully will be ready to then go in and do the third pass and be done, right? So I'm thinking what I'm looking at is probably this Wednesday we'll do the face. Next week, um, all of the other things that need to be done, everything that needs to be done to finalize stage three will get done sometime between Monday and Wednesday. And then the following week, I'll glaze and finish the painting, which might only be 
might only be two days, might be Monday and Tuesday, might only be Monday, depending on how much being that I'm gonna eat up next week, kind of picking away at this, there may be very little to do in the glaze when, I, when it comes time. <clears throat> So I'm just gonna go back in here. Same as I did in here, I'm just looking at, I'm gonna dust over all of the, um, the gold that is in shadows. Again, I'm not overly precise. I don't mind that it's pushing out a little bit outside of these shapes. I'm just trying to get a general, general dusting of these darker values. Again, the gold is so reflective that even in the shadows, it still holds a lot of light. The shadows really don't plug up very much. I'm trying to explain some of the little ripples in these tassels. And again, this isn't the end of the detail work on these on these decorative elements. It's just the be it's actually the beginning of it. It's easier for me to put it in here when I can do these big messy brush strokes than to try to do it later on. But if I drop it in now, they can be big, wet, just kind of bold strokes. If I do it later, I've got to work around everything. down a little bit, make it smooth and even. I want to be able, I don't want the marks that I'm making to make it harder to see the drawing shown through underneath. So I want to get rid of all the texture. So first thing I'm doing is just kind of beating it up, trying to knock edges down, neutralize some of it a little bit, spread it out. And then once I've got that, then I'll go with another brush, a softer brush, and I'll, um, Neutralize it a little further, and then I'll go and I'll drop in all my purples. These shapes are much bigger, so it should be a bit easier to to get all the um, the purple of the apron in um, without it being so labor intensive. <clears throat> This is a soft brush, it's just kind of scrubbing it down. I, I don't need the abrupt edges, so I just want to make sure they're, they're gone. And a lot 
of the places where this is really kind of messy, it's gonna be filled in with white and with purple, so it's not gonna show. So it can be messy. We don't have a lot of shadows in this. Most of this apron is in the light. So um, getting the shadows in should be relatively quick. Again, I'm looking at landmarks to figure out where everything goes. into the goals. Jeremy Wood said, I see the best of portraits in oil. Yours look very vintage. I don't know if all that has been shown. The other day, while waiting for you to arrive, I've seen some others on the way while waiting for you to get there. Anyway, the style looks similar. I love the work and patience you put into what you're doing. Thank you. You know, I'm, I, I love what I do, and, I, and so I'm never in a rush to get through it. And I think that's a very big, that's a, that's a very important thing. Like I'm never in a rush to get done with a painting because like I love doing it. I love the process of painting. And when I finish, I'm done. It's like rush, it's like eating candy and like scrambling to and get down. But if you just kind of savor it a little bit, it lasts longer. Like I savor this, I enjoy this when I do it. And so I'm in, I'm in no rush to be finished with it. And I think that in part because of that, um, the work has increased in quality because I'm really not looking to get done. I'm not looking to, to get to the next thing. I'm committed to every mark as I put it down. That doesn't mean every mark is perfect. Like I said, I mean, I was saying earlier about there's a difference between excellence and perfection. Perfection is you're never going to reach that. But you can you can achieve excellence just through just through um, being patient as you work, taking your time. I know this is not it's not the, the purple here, but this color is about the same what I'm putting down as the jacket. And I know I'm going to glaze this, but I'm just seeing that shape is just too broken up, too much stuff showing through. So I, I wanted to fix that. Just a little shake in there. And 
And again, these are just little fixes. I I would have to do that. I have to do it eventually. I, since I'm working in this, I'm just dropping it in. Um, I am thinking about actually going, I'm gonna take a look at the photograph. The, the purple on the cuff and the purple in the apron look a little bit, I know they're the same color, but they're darker down below. I'm actually gonna stick with the same color um, and then I'll glaze the difference in later on. I was debating, was debating how I wanted to handle that. I think it's easier to just do it that way. From Ved and Vaishali. Mm -hmm. Hello, Kevin, we miss our class. Thank you for doing this live portrait session. How can you stay focused on painting while answering questions? I, I've been doing this so long. Um, like you'll see as I'm, as I'm going, I stop, I stop painting at times when I'm talking because I can't do both. But there are areas in the painting that don't require, it's not that they don't require focus, but once I know what my intent is, I can move through a section um, that's really more of a road exercise, and then I'll shut up and focus here on the places that require a great deal of attention. Um, but I, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I, a lot of what I'm doing, I don't have to think too hard about. Um, I planned out what I'm doing, so I know exactly where I'm taking it, and so that definitely helps. That definitely helps. I hope you're doing well, and hopefully you'll be back. Um, we're hoping maybe May 15th, the school will be back and opened. I don't know what the governor said today, but hopefully May 15th. If not, definitely by June 1st, so. <clears throat> We have a lot of people from the school asking when we're going to be opened. Um, I'm, surprised, I'm surprised how many phone calls I get. Russ said, I bet he talks in his sleep. <laughs> I wouldn't know. No, you know what, I think I get it all out while I'm awake. <clears throat> I think when I'm awake, I get it all out and I'm a very peaceful sleeper. Purples are so bold against the against this orange. Um, once like this is such a nice feel. I don't know how well you see it um, on screen, but this is just it's just got such a really sweet feel to it. I almost don't want to paint over it and put in the uh, the details. I don't have a choice, but I really don't want to. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to to do the least amount. But to change the area the least amount possible and leave as much of that exposed. And I imagine this is going to feel the same way when it's in. Um, a really nice um, vibration um, because of the color combination. And I know where I intended on taking it will eliminate that vibration. And so debating whether or not to go there.
the moment, this is kind of like calling my number, which is nice. Uh, it's a nice break from like what I'll be dealing with. Like in the first, when I did the jacket, not so much so, but this, because everything is pretty well defined, it's just filling in around the shapes. Um, I'm happy to have the kind of slow tempo in here, a lot less thinking. Um, at this stage for this part. Again, that's not going to last. Um, but right now, I barely even have to look at the photograph. All the information is here. <clears throat> so I can just kind of fill. Which is nice. Like in the painting process, to have areas where you get to like calm down a little bit, not, not, be, um, not have to focus nearly so much back and forth between the reference and the subject matter. Again, eventually when I, when I start doing all the detail work, I'm gonna have to be glued to the photograph. But for now, while I'm doing this, and I don't need to be, I'm happy to have the, uh, happy to have the break. Maybe I'll do this and I'll stop. I'll pick it up tomorrow. You know, I just come to this up a little bit um, and stop. Like, I don't need to finish this. Um, I'm happy to finish this tomorrow and then do some other knickknacks. Yeah, so I think that's what we'll do. Okay. So we're going to finish up. I'm going to finish this up. I'm not going to do the whole apron. I'm going to finish this up and then we're going to call it a night. We tend to have problems here with our um, with our internet at about five o'clock it starts to get crazy and if we get all glitchy that's assuming we're not already there so I'm gonna polish this off just this little section where I can get a little break point down in here and then tomorrow I'll finish this and then move out into the rest of the painting and start cleaning up other things um, set the stage for Wednesday's face That was perfect. We went live for that, and now we're recording again. <laughs> really? Yeah, so everyone should have heard that. Good. Question from Rebecca. Yes. Is glaze on top of a painting repairable in like 250 years? Yeah. Why wouldn't it be? It's just a layer of paint. It's just a layer of paint. So, yes. All of the old masters glazed, and their paintings are all repairable. So. It's not a problem.
still really enjoying <clears throat> the way that these golds are peeking through the violet. They're really, really nice. And again, when the painting is done, I'll post a really clean high-res version of it um, that hopefully will show off um, the colors that you might not be seeing in the video. Connection is going in and out. That'll, that's good. Tomorrow will be will not be a crazy day. Four o'clock. We'll easily we'll easily get out of here on time. Four. So that's good. So what I'm, what I'm working towards here, why I didn't stop right in the middle, I'm gonna do it down here where I'm only gonna have a tiny, tiny little bit of purple that's gonna have to be married to turn the corner tomorrow. That's what we call a break point. Um, it's just a bottleneck where I won't have to match this shade along a very wide um, span. So even if, even if the value that I mix tomorrow goes a little bit off, which it won't be, but even if it was, and I'm putting wet paint against dry paint, it's just a tiny, tiny little space that has to be married. <clears throat> While we're live right now, I'm just going to announce to everyone that we will not be taking questions for the remainder of this. Kevin is just working to get to a break point um, so that we can pick this up tomorrow when we're not having quite so many networking issues.
Rebecca is asking if they can ask me questions like, in my family, do I have anyone else who paints? Yes, uh, my, I believe it was my great, great grandfather was a painter. We have some of his paintings uh, in my parents' home. <clears throat> I wasn't not I wasn't not taking questions um, because I couldn't concentrate and do that. This is just we know that at five o'clock this starts to get glitchy, and so we just wanted to make sure that if you asked a question, if I wasn't able to answer it, that would be problematic. So easier to just not take questions. Let me just knock this out. We'll call it a day. I'm going to come back. We'll finish up the apron tomorrow. And then a couple of other knickknacks around the painting and get everything ready for the, the face on Wednesday. So, sounds good. I'm going to soften this edge a little bit. This is a cast shadow. Derek Scott says, thank you for doing this. Hey, Derek, how are you? I owe you a phone call. Uh, I haven't forgotten. I owe you a phone call. Oh, I forgot. I actually got something. I gotta get this in here. I don't want to leave just the shadow. So again, I found a break point here. I'm going to end it right here and here where it's a tiny, tiny little place that I'll have to marry it to continue. I'm going to go around and soften the edges on these very dark pieces here, and then I think I'm good.
Derek said, I know giving instructions has slowed you down a bit. How do you feel about your current progress and where you are at this stage? Um, well, I would say that I probably, I'm probably working at about half speed. Um, this painting I estimated between 25 to 30 hours. Daniel, Daniel said it was impossible, but that's actually the rate that it should have gotten done. So I'm working about half speed. I think we're gonna clock about 60 hours to complete this, maybe less, maybe 50. Um, but I'm fine, I'm fine. Like I was saying, like, I'm happy to be here painting, <laughs> you know? I'm just happy to be painting. Um, and I, you know, that might sound crazy to some people, like, but I don't actually get to paint that much. Most of my time is spent showing other people how to paint these days. I don't really get to paint much. And so an opportunity like this, um, I'm really, I'm really enjoying it. I am savoring it because I don't have the kind of time. I don't have 60 hours to sit around and hang out and talk and, and do something like this. Normally I put my head down and not speak to anybody and get my work done. This is nice. It's nice for me. I'm enjoying, it feels more like a stroll and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. So I'm actually quite appreciative of the fact that I have the downtime, as much as I don't want the, the, the downtime. Um, I'm appreciative of what it's doing for me, at least when this is concerned. It's giving, me, it's giving me a chance to kind of slow everything down in my life. I've got no place to be, and I'm able to share this and, and, and converse and not feel like I'm on a deadline to get it done and get it delivered. I do have a deadline on it, but like even for that, the deadline, I don't even know if they can collect the painting at that time. So um, I'll, I'll basically I'll meet the deadline and then it'll just, you know, it'll be a matter of whether or not they can um, take possession of the painting. But um, I'm just enjoying the fact that I get to, I get to kind of hang out. Like I'm, like I, I'm not sure if you can tell, but like as I'm working, like I don't feel any pressure even, even the stuff that's not necessarily easy. I don't feel any pressure. I'm just kind of relaxed and kind of moving through the piece. And part of that is the fact that I don't have, I, I have all the time in the world to play with this because of what's going on. And so, um, like I said, I mean, I'm just, just enjoying it. So I don't, have, I don't have any problem with the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm clocking twice the amount of hours that I would normally expect. I have no issue with that at all. I'm enjoying the company, to be quite honest. So, uh, and as I go, I keep finding new places that I've got to put stuff in. So I got to get this in here too. And again, just enough to merge. I mean, I just don't want to leave any of these shadows not graded into the lighter version of the purple. That's all I'm doing. I just want to make sure I'm not leaving these abrupt edges. So, and again, some of this I'll have to overpaint tomorrow, and, but, but that's fine. Um, it's more just making sure I don't leave a, a, a dark shadow 
and let it dry where there's supposed to be a gradient and I have a hard edge and then I have to try to get rid of the hard edge. So I think we are good. Again, I just want to make sure I'm taking out any brush strokes, any texture that I've left behind. I want to make sure it's all very smooth and very even. Um, so when it dries, there's no, there's no fingerprint of how the painting was done. Again, we talked about that earlier, that that's really one of my, one of my trademark things I like to leave. I like to leave no physical evidence of how the painting was created. Okay, yeah, so we are good for today. We're going to leave it right there. So, um, as we said, no questions for today, just because we're already late and internet's going to be a little glitchy. So we're going to kill it right here. Um, we're going to pick up tomorrow. I'm going to finish off the apron and then start playing around with some of these other things, maybe establish the metals a little better, maybe a little bit of work on the book, there's some lettering and some other things I could probably lay in. Uh, possibly even start playing around with some of the metals. We'll, we'll see what the time looks like. Um, tomorrow will definitely be a 12 to four. We'll definitely cut at four o'clock, um, but we should, be able to, we should be able to finalize a lot of things here um, and have them prepped and ready to go for the third stage before I get the face going on Wednesday. Now on Wednesday, um, Wednesday will very likely run over four o'clock. We'll, we'll figure out the internet thing for, for Wednesday, um, but we'll, we'll manage that and so that we have, we have solid internet, hopefully. Um, it'll pr we're probably gonna run maybe five to six hours, I think, on the face. Um, maybe not, I could be wrong, but I'm, be, I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of questions. I'm expecting heavier traffic than we normally have um, because people like to see faces painted. So, um, but I imagine it's gonna run a little bit longer than expected on, uh, on Wednesday for the portrait, or for, for the face in the portrait. Anyway, thank you everybody for making it today and I will see you tomorrow. Have a great night.